What's going on guys, this is Rob. Uh, if you guys enjoy my content, make sure you hit the subscribe button and make sure you hit that little bell so you never miss out on my sexy voice. So I'll be honest with you guys, when it came to the Green Lantern mythos, it had always been so daunting to me. I mean, because it was so huge in scope. There's really never been anything like Jeff John's run on Green Lantern. The only thing that I can think would be equivalent to that from like Marvel, for example, would be like if Jonathan Hickman, instead of writing the Avengers and New Avengers leading up to Secret Wars, he had started all the way back with Civil War, then he covered Secret Invasion, then he, then he covered, you know, the Avengers Initiative, then he went to you know, Dark Reign and then Siege and then Fear Itself and then the Heroic Age and all those things that led into Hickman's, you know, his his Avengers and New Avengers run going up to Secret Wars. Jeff John's writing of the Green Lantern mythos is that expansive. It literally changed everything about the Green Lantern mythos. Not only that, you also had contributing writers, more specifically Colin Bunn, with regards to the history of Sinestro himself. And so, because of the fact that this channel exists to explain things, <laughs> because of the fact that this channel exists to make sense out of comic books and give you a place to start if what you're looking to do is get into a series, we're going to do exactly that. When it comes to the Green Lantern mythos in DC Comics, Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps is really more designed for seasoned readers, for those fans who have been following the series the entire time. Green Lanterns is designed for those individuals who want to get into the mythos and quite literally learn about the Green Lantern mythos as Simon Baz and Jessica Cruz learn about it. But it doesn't mean that Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps is designed to alienate new readers, not at all. In fact, there's really only a couple things, maybe three things that we need to know before we start getting into Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps. The first of these is Sinestro. Now, in the New 52, DC launched a Sinestro-centric line of stories, and these were quite literally designed to just focus on Sinestro himself. Not only that, they also offered a little bit of retconning with regards to his history. Prior to, and really during the early days of Jeff John's run on the Green Lantern mythos, it was always just assumed that Sinestro was at one point a Green Lantern, he had become drunk with power, uh, he had basically tried to force order on his home world Karuger, and as a result, he was looked at by the Guardians of the Universe as having abused his power, he was exiled from the core, and eventually Sinestro became a Yellow Lantern and formed his own Sinestro Corps. That was the universal standard with regards to his history, right? What DC did is they came along and they said that was not necessarily the case. Instead, somewhere along the line, Sinestro had a daughter named Saranic, and what happened was he came to the realization that his home world Karuger was just too chaotic for a child to be raised. In. And so as a Green Lantern, he chose to basically force order on the planet so that his child could grow up in a suitable environment. Because of this, he was cast out of the of the Green Lantern Corps and ultimately formed the Sinestro Corps in response to this. Now, because of that, things began to unfold as we saw with the Sinestro Corps War, different things like that. What's happening here with this particular story, what Robert Venditti is doing is he's basically taking the concept of the Sinestro Corps War and he's turning it on its head. With the original Sinestro Corps War, they were the, uh, they were basically the ones on the outside trying to break their way in, right? The Green Lanterns were the established police of the DC Universe. The Sinestro Corps were the ones who were infiltrating. With this, it's the opposite circumstance with Sinestro's Law. Instead, in the events that led up to DC Rebirth, the Green Lantern Corps in its entirety basically vanished. They disappeared. In the beginning, nobody really knew where they had gone to, and even now in the, the Green Lantern comics, no, or nobody really knew what had happened to them. Now, we as the reader know that the Green Lantern Corps, uh, with regards to Jon Stewart and Guy Gardner and all those other members, had basically been thrust into the past, into the last days of the universe prior to the current one. And so they were basically lanterns out of time. But there was no Green Lantern Corps in the DC universe, and so because of this, this allowed Sinestro to have the Sinestro Corps move in to becoming the protectors of the of the DC Universe to basically take the place of the Green Lantern Corps. Now, what happened with this, there was a story arc that was written called The Palings, and The Palings were led by a guy called The Pale Bishop, I believe. And this story centered on the idea of The Palings lacking emotion. There was no real ties to emotion to them. Well, the problem with that is the Lantern Corps exist based on emotion. Each Lantern Corps has a source of power, which is an entity. You have Parallax for the Yellow Lanterns, and you have the Bull for the Red Lantern, Lanterns, so on and so forth, but because of the fact that the Palings couldn't feel emotion, the powers of the Green Lanterns were limited only in so far, or I guess the powers of all the Lantern Corps were limited only in so far as their ability to create constructs that could physically combat the Palings. Instead, they couldn't instill fear in the Palings and turn them to their cores. And so what happened here is the Sinestro Corps basically took over the mantle as the police of the DC Universe, and they started fighting off against the Palings. Now, it was, it was literally a universe-wide conflict. I mean, it involved everybody fighting on behalf 
half of the Sinestro Corps against these Palings and the Pale Bishop. Ultimately, Sinestro was successful in this. The problem was that prior to the Green Lanterns vanishing, his daughter Saranic had become a more intricate part of his life. And so where she was originally a Green Lantern, she was more or less forcibly inducted into the Sinestro Corps by Sinestro himself, but she never really shared their feelings. Now we'll get into that more as we go through the story because she's really one of the central characters in this event. And it's really cool to see what Robert Venditti is doing with the evolution of her character. But the fact remains here that once the, the battle with the Pale Bishop was over, Sinestro, at least it's, it's alluded to the idea that he had more or less kind of sacrificed part of his soul for the purpose of defeating the Pale Bishop. And because of this, he wasn't really at full strength anymore. He wasn't at full capacity. Now, this is where things get a little bit hairy. And the reason why is because DC Rebirth was planned out quite a bit before the conclusion of the Sinestro story. And I was talking to Benny about this and he had mentioned that Robert Venditti had been told that by the time the Sinestro story was going to be over, that Sinestro was going to be old. But we know that with issue number 23 of Sinestro, he was still relatively young and he wasn't nearly as old as he looked during the events of Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps Rebirth. And so what the Rebirth issue was designed to do was to basically wrap up those loose ends regarding the Edge of Oblivion and the Lost Lanterns, regarding uh, Sinestro looking old, how to restore him to his youth, so on and so forth. But more so than that, it also focused on Hal Jordan. Now, with regards to chronology of the Green Lantern mythos in the DC uh, Rebirth universe, Hal Jordan and the Green Lanterns takes place before Green Lantern's Rebirth. And the reason we know this is that Hal Jordan was not one of the Lanterns, one of the Green Lanterns that found himself thrown back in time to the previous universe. Instead, what had happened is that over the course of the, the, the events that took place in Jeff John's run, all these different conflicts that had happened, Wrath of the First Lantern and, you know, Rage of the Red Lanterns and so on and so forth, even the Sinestro Corps War itself, society had sort of begun to uh, lose faith in the Green Lanterns. And the reason why was that because on a, on a personal level, the various citizens of the DC universe didn't look at it as the Sinestro Corps are the ones that are trying to take over the universe. They simply saw it as a conflict between the Green Lanterns and everyone else. And because of the fact that the Green Lanterns, while they were protecting, trying to protect the universe, because of the fact that these conflicts spilled over into other planets, because it saw the destruction of other races and so on and so forth, the various inhabitants of the universe began to sort of shy away from the Green Lanterns. And so what this did is this led into to Hal Jordan effectively falling on his own sword, basically more or less taking the stance that he would come out or he would look to be the renegade of sorts. And in response, the Green Lanterns would seek him out. Now this was all just an illusion and it was designed to restore the honor of the Green Lanterns in the eyes of the universe's citizenry. The problem with this was that the Edge of Oblivion event happened and suddenly the Green Lantern Corps was gone. And so this left Hal Jordan without a power ring. It left Hal Jordan without the ability to be a Green Lantern. And so what DC Rebirth did with regards to Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern's Rebirth is it came along and it had Hal Jordan uh, more or less becoming willpower in and of itself. And the way this worked was that while he was on the run, he had taken an artifact that had previously belonged to Krona. And I'm a little fuzzy exactly on how this artifact worked, but it allowed him to basically operate as a Green Lantern without actually having a Green Lantern ring. The problem with this was that the effects of the gauntlet on Hal Jordan, at least it seemed to more or less merge Hal Jordan with willpower in and of itself. And so instead of Hal Jordan simply just manipulating the Green Lantern ring and and using willpower, he was becoming willpower. Now this created a whole new set of events because it really heightened the power of what it was that Hal Jordan was capable of. The issue with this was that at the same time, it seemed as though Hal Jordan in his traditional sense, that is to say, as a normal human being, was beginning to fade away, beginning to go away. And so what happened here is that in the, the Hal Jordan and the Green, uh, Green Lantern Rebirth mythos, Hal Jordan had come to the conclusion that with the Green Lanterns gone, they have to return in some form or fashion. Not only that, he has to find out where they went to. And so what he did is he quite literally used the power of will, used this weird situation that he had with regards to these new abilities and made a Green Lantern ring using willpower. Now, the reason why this is such a big deal is because traditionally and prior to this, it was believed that only the guardians of the universe could do that, that a, a sentient being couldn't just come along and create a Green Lantern ring. And the reason why was because if it was common knowledge, if everybody could create a Green Lantern ring or create any kind of a lantern ring, then anyone could make a lantern ring anywhere. And they would, 
would just be this whole host of lanterns all over the place. It wouldn't mean that we'd have 9,000 different parts of the emotional spectrum, but what it does mean is you would have groups all over the place. You'd have Green Lantern group here and a Green Lantern group there and a Green Lantern group over there, and they would all operate, you know, separate from one another. They'd have conflicting themes and it would literally lead to a civil war between all of the Lantern Corps. And so because of this, the idea was to always keep that knowledge constrained, to always keep anybody from being able to use that knowledge. More so than that, what this does is it elevates Hal Jordan. It says that Hal Jordan is no longer just the greatest of the Green Lanterns. Instead, he's the definitive Green Lantern. Not only that, he'll likely become the source of power for all the Green Lanterns. But again, at this point, we're really just kind of kind of spitballing. That's getting into territory that we're not 100% sure about. And so because of the fact that Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Rebirth uh, events started with Sinestro being old, which was contrary to how it was supposed to start with regards to him maintaining his youth at the end of the original Sinestro story, what uh, Robert Venditti did is he basically came along and he had Sinestro merge with the Parallax entity. Now this has only happened maybe once or twice before, but it was just basically a way for Robert Venditti to restore the youth of Sinestro. And so because of this, Sinestro now returns to his position as being head of the Sinestro Corps. Not only that, Robert Venditti doesn't simply just write it off and just say, well, it's just a way to return him to his youth. He ties it into the story, which is actually really well done. What he says here is that with regards to uh, Sinestro returning to his youth, this was all part of the plan. That the plan was to look at his daughter who was altruistic, to make her head of the Sinestro Corps. And in the time between the, the end of the Sinestro series and the start of Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern's uh, Green Lantern Corps rebirth, that she would basically start moving the Sinestro Corps in a direction to where not only would they be the police of the universe to take the place of the Green Lanterns, but society, the, the citizens of the universe would grow to love them. And when that point came, when it came to the point where the citizens of the universe welcomed the Sinestro Corps as their police, then Sinestro would make his move. He would reinstate himself as head of the Sinestro Corps, and then he would grab absolute power in the universe. And that's exactly what happened here. When he made himself young, the idea was to basically make himself, put himself in absolute control. And he even tells his daughter this. When she shows up and she says, what's going on here? Why are you young? You know, he says, well, this was all part of the plan. Now, he's a little iffy about it. Right? I mean, he doesn't necessarily come out and say, ha ha, I tricked you. Instead, she's the one that actually figures it out first. And she says, so you were always going to be better. All you had to do was merge with a parallax entity. You always knew you had to do that. Why wait now? And so then he says, well, the idea was to basically have you move the Sinestro Corps into being the police of the universe. People would welcome us and then I'll take over control. Now, the reason why he does this is because the Sinestro Corps feeds on fear. That's basically how it powers itself. And so if they're, if they're in absolute control of the universe, if they're spread to every corner of the universe, he does exactly what makes sense. He tells his Sinestro Corps to go throughout the universe and spread fear everywhere. That way, it'll bolster the power of the Sinestro Corps. Now, the reason for why he does this will actually become clear here in a little bit, but what I want to do is I want to transition back to Hal Jordan here. And the reason why is after Hal Jordan had arrived on Earth and he had made, or I guess he had gone to Simon Baz and Jessica Cruz and said, you are now members of the Justice League. You are also Green Lanterns. You guys are going to share a central battery core. That way you all, or I guess a, a, a power battery core. That way you all can, uh, you know, you'll be forced to work together. When he had taken off into space to find the Green Lanterns, that's the early part of the story. That's really all he does in the beginning of this is him hunting around, trying to find the Green Lanterns. Now he does interrogate various people, but in the midst of the Sinestro Corps traveling around the universe and instilling fear in its various citizens in order to bolster their power, a couple of them come across Hal Jordan. Now, I'll be honest with you guys. I had never really considered the Green Lantern mythos to be some something epic, right? You know, I mean, to me, it was like, yeah, Green Lanterns, they can do stuff. There's Lantern Corps, whatever. This story totally changed my mind. It was, <laughs> not only is this story amazing, Guy Gardner is a badass. Like, it's it's so cool. But Hal Jordan, like, Robert Venditti really establishes in us what Hal Jordan was capable of. The worst case scenario for the Sinestro Corps is that if there were only going to be one Green Lantern left in the universe, that it would be Hal Jordan. That's the worst situation they could have because Hal Jordan is the definitive Green Lantern. He's the one guy that not only has what it takes to make the Green Lantern Corps great again, to reinstate it, but he's also the greatest of them in the sense of his battle prowess, his intelligence, intelligence, and so on. And so because of this, with these couple members of the Sinestro Corps initially come into contact with him, the idea is they believe they can take Hal Jordan out. They believe they can actually, you know, take him off on their own. Now, Sinestro's told 
that Hal Jordan has been discovered. But Sinestro initially freaks out about this because his idea, you know, when, when he's informed by this, his, his thought process is this is the worst thing that could have happened. This is the worst situation that could have happened. We don't need Hal Jordan here because he will, he's literally a one man army and he will just disrupt everything that's going on. Now, there's something else to also take note of is that this comic also features the return of the, of the Green Lantern Corps uh, to this universe. Now, we're not given a whole lot in terms of, you know, what this means and initially, but what we are told is that the ranks have been thinned, that where the Green Lantern Corps almost in its entirety was sent to this old reality, that about 90% and maybe 95% of their fighting force was obliterated on their journey back. And so because of this, they're at a fraction of their number. Now, with regards to the Green Lantern Corps under the control of Jon Stewart and with, uh, you know, Guy Gardner sort of as a second in command or at the least as one of his most respected, uh, one of his most respected members, they're stuck in a pickle here. They're stuck in a, in a rough situation. And the reason why is because because they don't know what's going on in the universe right now. Not only that, the universe is a huge place and their number is small. Their long range communications are offline. Everything they need to operate in a measurable capacity is not there. So they can't send one of their guys to the far side of the universe and maintain contact because their rings just don't have that ability at the moment, that entire system's offline. And so because of this, they more or less have to use short range investigations, but ultimately the decisions made to have one of their guys go out into the universe and see if they can't figure out what's going on. Now, this person is basically elected, or I guess he steps forward as Guy Gardner. Now, again, we're going to find out how badass Guy Gardner is because he's actually pretty sweet in this comic. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. But what I want to do is I want to, again, I want to jump back to, to Hal Jordan here because I kind of feel like Hal Jordan, of course, is one of the central characters in this story. When Sinestro learns that Hal Jordan is going off against a couple of the Sinestro core members, his immediate response is run, get out of there, come back here, we'll, we'll martial our forces and then we'll take on Hal Jordan but they basically ignore the order <laughs> much to their own uh, to their own demise what happens here is they decide to take him on they believe that they have him captured and they tell Sinestro uh, we have Hal Jordan captured and Sinestro flips he says you you morons I told you to get out of there like I told you to leave and so because of this of course Hal Jordan is able to break his way out and he he again continues the fight now again this is Robert Venditti telling us that Hal Jordan is not a pushover Hal Jordan's not a guy that you just run over you know that he's very formidable in his own right because he's fought so many members of the Sinestro Corps. Not only that, he was taught at the knee of Sinestro himself. And so because of this, he can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Sinestro. That means that he could easily take on Sinestro's core members. They don't really stand much of a chance. And so again, once this uh, this conflict, as this battle continues on between Hal Jordan and these uh, members of the Sinestro Corps, ultimately we also see that a whole host of Sinestro Corps members show up as well in an effort to take on Hal Jordan and, uh, and effectively subdue him. Now, because of the fact that Guy Gardner has been sent out into the universe in search of the events that are going on to find out what's happening right now. The issue is that he was given a 24 hour window. This was really just Jon Stewart operating pragmatically, right? You know, it was him saying, look, I'm the leader of the Green Lantern Corps right now. I've got to think of the best way to keep this Lantern Corps intact because again, they're operating in isolation here. They don't know that Hal Jordan is going off against the Sinestro Corps. They don't know the Sinestro Corps has taken over as a police force of the universe. They have no idea what's been going on. So they're basically operating on the sense of of complete blindness. And so because of this, you know, really Jon Stewart's kind of biding his time. He's really kind of waiting. But for him, it's also the idea that not only may he lose one of his strongest members, he'll also lose a great friend. Because despite the rivalry that exists between the two of them, despite their various issues in the past, there's a massive amount of respect between them. And the reason why is because we learn that Guy Gardner seems to have, he's run into a couple of, of members of the Sinestro Corps, basically, or at least it seems as though he's in the process of a battle and he's being, he's going to be taken prisoner. Now, switching back to Hal Jordan here, Hal Jordan is easily able to take on the rest of the Sinestro Corps without too much effort here. And this is a big deal. <laughs> this is huge because, again, this really hits home to the fact that Hal Jordan is so capable in his abilities. Not only that, because of the fact that the Sinestro Corps rings feed on fear, it's not just a simple situation of empowering themselves. What Sinestro's done is he's created a fear engine. And what this fear engine does is it basically allows the Sinestro Corps members to capture various denizens from around the universe, take them back, hook them up to the machine, and then the machine feeds off their fear, which in turn powers all of the Sinestro Corps rings. And so it's basically an endless supply of energy for the Sinestro Corps that's not tied into Parallax. Now, what this does, or what, what this basically did, is it gave Robert Venditti a way out. If Parallax was going to be the source, or continue to be the source of the 
of the Yellow Lantern Corps, it would more or less be a situation whereby all it would take is for Parallax to be contained, defeated, isolated, something along those lines, but he would still live on. If it were the, uh, if it were a fear engine, it gives Robert Venditti away to have the Green Lanterns defeat Sinestro by massively reducing the amount of power that he has. Now, again, we'll get through this or we'll, we'll talk more about this as we go through, but for the most part, a lot of this really focuses on Hal Jordan facing off against the Sinestro Corps, but it also focuses on the idea that because the fear engine is powering the Sinestro rings, that their power is being amplified to 115%, to 150%, to 200% of their normal power. But the kicker here is that Hal Jordan has an ace up his sleeve. At this point, he's transforming into pure willpower. And so it seems as though he's not really limited by what it is that he's capable of, and or at least what it is that a ring is normally capable of. And so because of this, while he is able to hold his own for a time, the idea is that he's ultimately not able to hold his own against the members of the Sinestro Corps that have so much power. And so because of this, it looks as though he's basically defeated. Now from here, we switch over to Sinestro himself, and we have Sinestro being presented with a Green Lantern that the members of the Sinestro Corps have captured. Now, in a perfect world for Sinestro, this would be Hal Jordan laying here, and he would be celebrating. He would say, yes, we have Hal Jordan. We can basically, you know, we can break his will. We can control his fear. We can hook him up to the fear engine, and our power will be amplified to levels that we can't even imagine yet. But when they show him who the Green Lantern is, it's Guy Gardner. Now, for the Guy Gardner fans out there, I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> Guy Gardner's cool, but he's no Hal Jordan. And I don't know if maybe this is the message that Robert Venditti was trying to communicate, but if if what he did here came off as, well, it's just Guy Gardner, he's no to worry about, he makes up for it <laughs> later on because Guy Gardner. <laughs> Guy Gardner is the man. Guy Gardner is so badass. Now, to sidetrack here for a quick second, we're gonna jump back to Guy Gardner here. To sidetrack for a quick second, what we learned is that Hal Jordan was not actually defeated. Well, he was, but he wasn't taken by the Sinestro Corps, which we know. Instead, he was taken by somebody else and is presumed to be the daughter of Sinestro, who is now working against him in an effort to, to basically remove him from his position and restore the, uh, the Yellow Lantern Corps back to being a reliable police force. But jumping back to Sinestro, the idea here is that where he believed that Hal Jordan was going to be brought to him, the fact that his daughter had taken Hal Jordan was confirmed when the Yellow Lanterns returned without Hal Jordan. And when he had said, you guys told me you had him captured, why isn't he here? They had said, well, your daughter showed up and told us that you ordered her to bring him or to basically take him. And so Sinestro says, no, 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 no. I told you to bring him here. Don't listen to my daughter. Listen to me. And then he just kills that guy. Now, of course, this shows us the ruthless nature of Sinestro. But more so than that, it also shows shows us that again, his daughter is working to, to basically uh, subvert his control, that she's working against him as opposed to trying to help him. More so than that, it also tells us that his daughter was never a true Yellow Lantern. Now this will be something that will be spoken about later on, but you know, it's, it's, it's a really a passing line later. And I think right now presents the best opportunity to have that discussion. With regards to his daughter, she was very much a member of the Green Lantern Corps for a time. And it really seemed as though she was best suited to be a Green Lantern. Becoming a Yellow Lantern was not her decision. She was conscripted by her father, again, as part of his plan to elevate the, the Sinestro Corps to being this police force that people celebrated, that people loved. The problem with this was that for her, when it came to the Sinestro Corps, they were largely people who were weak-minded. They were largely people who relished in destruction and creating fear and terrifying other people, those individuals who just thrived on conflict. That wasn't who she was. And so because of this, while she was a Yellow Lantern, she was never part and parcel to it. And so what this does is it basically tells us that her being, I guess, working against Sinestro is showing her for, for who she truly is. She's a good person at heart, and she recognizes the fact that Sinestro, her father, despite the fact that he is her father, is no fit leader for the Sinestro Corps if the Sinestro Corps is going to operate to take the place of the Green Lanterns. And so what we do here is we jump back to uh, to Guy Gardner. And this is why I say Guy Gardner is such a badass. Like this, this is one of the most badass things that I've ever seen in the history of comics. And I've seen some pretty awesome stuff. So with Guy Gardner being taken by by Sinestro. He was originally given this, this modicum of power with his ring in order to ensure life support when he was traveling across the cosmos. The problem is that once he's actually there on War World, once he's you know held within the confines of Sinestro's locale in their little torture room, he conjures a, a construct, but the power is not nearly enough to take on Sinestro. And so because of this, he drains what's left of his power ring, and he's basically just standing around naked here. Uh, but he also starts talking trash. Like he, he <laughs> like he's in a situation where he, it would very much cost him his life. He could probably die. And he's just talking smack. Like he's literally just like giving him hell. <laughs> 
<laughs> and so because of this, like when the question is asked or when the situation, when, when Sinestro presents the situation and saying, we're going to break your willpower and we are going to force you to be, you know, become part of the fear engine. And we're going to force you to tell us where the rest of the Green Lantern Corps is. He's like, man, like you're, that's not going to happen. <laughs> no matter what happens, he refuses to break. And that's actually what happens. Like he refuses to break, but the way that he refuses to break is absolutely amazing. And so what happens is we jump back to John Stewart and this is really just Robert Venditti giving us this all hands on deck. Because if you guys have noticed, he's building up to this massive conflict. You have Hal Jordan trying to find the Green Lanterns. Uh, he's been taken or not really been taken prisoner, but he's basically been rescued by the daughter of Sinestro who's working against her father. You have Guy Gardner who's been taken prisoner by Sinestro, but he's working against Sinestro. And then you have John Stewart and the Green Lantern Corps. Now what John Stewart says is we've got two choices. The smarter road would be to simply just wait here. To be, to, would be to just stay here on the edge of the universe where no one knows we're at and to wait to see if Guy Gardner returns. The problem with this is that it's very possible that Guy Gardner has been captured. And if he has been captured, then he's probably not gonna come back. Not only that, if he's being tortured or being held prisoner, they may kill him. In which case, if we do nothing, we might as well have killed him ourselves. So he says, either we can stay here and do nothing or we can go find Guy Gardner. We can make our presence known to the universe and we can do whatever we need to do. But because they're Green Lanterns, and this is why this is so badass. Because they're Green Lanterns, they're like, we don't sit around. We don't rest on our laurels. Whether it's whether we win or whether we all die, we're gonna go find Guy Gardner and we're gonna do our damnedest to rescue him. So what we do, God, this is so badass. So what we do is we jump to Guy Gardner, all right? And Guy Gardner is being interrogated. He's literally being tortured, but he won't talk. He won't tell them where the Green Lantern Corps is. Not only that, we <laughs> <laughs> Not only that, there's this amazing line that he says where the guy's torturing him and he says, you better put your back into it, Cupcake. What an awesome thing to say. <laughs> what an awesome line. But the really cool thing here is that when the when the torturer begins a process of, of basically saying, fine, we're going to enhance the torture, we're going to make it worse for you, Guy Gardner starts running off the Green Lantern Oath. Not only that, he'll keep doing that. Like, And it's, it's so cool because for me, Guy Gardner always seemed like the joke right? He always seemed like the guy that no one took seriously. He was a frat boy in the Green Lantern Corps, and in a lot of ways he was. But what Robert Venditti is telling us here, and I'm sure has been previously established in Jeff John's run, is that yeah, Guy Gardner's a joker, Guy Gardner's silly, Guy Gardner is nonsensical from time to time, but he's got it where it counts. And that is so awesome. <laughs> That's really cool here. And so what we do is again, we basically pick up with Hal Jordan speaking with the daughter of Sinestro. And what happens here is she basically says, I use some of the yellow uh, power of fear to more or less fix you up. But she also notices that he crafted his own ring because it's not the same kind of design that all the other Green Lanterns have. And the question is, how did you do this? Where did this ring come from? How is this possible? And he simply says, I made it myself. I put it together myself. Not only that, he also tells her that he seems to be coming one with, with willpower in and of itself. His body or his, his, his structure seems to be changing. And so again, it, we're not really given a whole lot of information here in terms of what this means. The indication is that because he's becoming one with willpower, he is becoming willpower itself. He is becoming literally a living construct. But we don't know that for absolute certainty. All we really know here is that his powers seem to be moving in a new direction, moving into a new echelon. And so switching back to Jon Stewart and the Green Lantern Corps, what we find here is that while they're transitioning across the cosmos, while they're traveling to whatever it is or whatever direction it was that Guy Gardner went in, they're suddenly met upon by a host of ships. And the ships that they all meet uh, initially seem to possibly be enemies and they take on defensive formations. But what happens is we learn that there's, there's actually a little bit more going on here, that with Sinestro going through, with his core going through, inflicting fear, terrifying people, uh, kidnapping them and hooking them up to the fear engine, that not every one is okay with this. Not only that, the, a lot of the people, a lot of the citizens in the universe, they're not cowards, that they're basically marshalling their forces as best they can. And eventually with their forces marshaled, they intend to wage a war against Sinestro. Now we know that's suicide. We know that if these guys, these various alien races were to try to take on the entirety of the Sinestro Corps, especially with the Sinestro Corps' power being bolstered by virtue of the Spear Engine, that it would, it would lead to their complete and utter ruin. But when in meeting the Green Lanterns, they basically come to a 
reconciliation, these guys say, hey, look, the Sinestro Corps has gone crazy. They're taking over the universe. And Jon Stewart says, well, we're trying to find our guy, Guy Gardner. Uh, have you seen him? They say no. And they say, okay, fine. Well, let's just rally our forces. We'll deal with the Sinestro Corps while we try to find Guy Gardner. And so one of the other interesting things here, this is something that I that I hope you guys like is, or I hope you guys notice, is that with the Green Lanterns, they're, they haven't been forgotten. People still know who they are. Well, there are a lot of people in the new generation of alien races that were born relatively recently who hearken to the Sinestro Corps and say, yeah, there there are uh, there are saviors and they don't, their planet hasn't been attacked yet. They don't realize what the Sinestro Corps is doing. For the old guard, they remember back to the days when the Green Lanterns were the true protectors of the universe. And that while the Green Lanterns may have engaged in conflicts that laid waste to planets, and while the Green Lanterns may have in and of themselves, some members turned evil, the fact remains that the Green Lanterns were always a force for good. They were always there to protect the universe as best they could, even if there was collateral damage. And so this seems to be the old guard, or at the very least, those who remember the way things were before, that the Green Lanterns existed to protect people. And so by joining forces, it allows the various weapons of these, these, uh, these armies to work in conjunction with the construct abilities of the Green Lanterns, and in turn, present a pretty formidable army, or at the very least, it bolsters their ranks. And so again, what we do here is we pick up with Hal Jordan. Now, what Hal Jordan had done during the, the latter half of his conversation with uh, the daughter of Sinestro is he had said, look, like, I know I have a whole new set of abilities now. I know I'm more powerful than I was before. Here's what's gonna happen. I am going to go to the home base of Sinestro and I'm gonna defeat him. But when I get there, there's going to be a lot of damage because I'm going to destroy Warworld. So if you have anybody on that planet that you care about, anybody on that planet that you think will fight for our side, then you need to get them out of there. And in fact, that's what she says. She says, hey, look, not everybody who's part of the Sinestro Corps believes in the Sinestro Corps. You know, there are people who are part of the Sinestro Corps that are there because it's better to be on the devil's right hand than in his path, but it doesn't mean that they agree with what they're doing. And so what she says is if we, if we give them a chance to stand up and fight against Sinestro, they will do that. They will literally fight from within. It'll create a civil war within the Sinestro Corps. And so Hal Jordan says, fine, go do that. Marshal those forces. And when I get there, we'll all take on Sinestro together. Now, again, something to keep in mind is that Hal Jordan does not know about the rest of the Green Lantern Corps, and he doesn't know about Guy Gardner. So in his mind, he's going into this conflict with the power that he possesses using his newfound connection with willpower and whatever forces the daughter of Sinestro can marshal to their side. That's all he knows is really coming there. But this also gives us some perspective of how Jordan and views himself with regards to his new power. If he's willing to go headlong into a battle against the Sinestro Corps, then it means one of two things. It means either he realizes how powerful he is or he's he's batshit crazy. <laughs> but we know that it means that he's he knows how powerful he is now. And so again, what happens, and this is something that's really funny here, is what happens is we transition back to Guy Gardner again because Guy Gardner, <laughs> Guy Gardner, I love you, man. So we transition back to Guy Gardner again and with the the chronicler slash you know concubine of Sinestro showing up, uh, basically saying we need to speed up this torture of of Guy Gardner. Guy Gardner hits on her. <laughs> he says he says somebody needs to call the police because the way you look is killing me, <laughs> which is hilarious to me. And so of course it's just Guy Gardner being silly, but it's also Guy Gardner setting a standard. This is Guy Gardner saying like you're you're not going to get me to talk. I'm so sure you can't get me to talk that I'm going to crack jokes and I'm going to be silly. And so what the what this woman says, what Lysa says, is she's basically speaking with, you know, the interrogator and she says, look, an, an attack is coming. There's going to be an assault on Warworld. Hal Jordan is coming to fight us. This is the first time that Guy Gardner realizes that Hal Jordan is now back to being a Green Lantern again, that Hal Jordan is back, that Hal Jordan is launching a campaign to attack Sinestro. Now, this is very very important. And the reason why is because this gives Guy Gardner renewed hope. And that's one of the most important things when it comes to the Green Lantern mythos. Yes, the Green Lanterns reside on will. The willpower, you know, willpower is the source of their strength and their ability. But willpower is useless if you don't believe that things will get better. If you can't hope that things will get better. That's one of the reasons why the Blue Lanterns of Hope are such an intricate part of the Green Lantern mythos. Of course, I believe at this point the Blue Lanterns have all been wiped out. But the fact remains here that hope is a very powerful thing because it leads you to believe 
believe that things can get better. And this is exactly what happens with Guy Gardner. While Hal Jordan is launching his campaign, while he's taking on almost the entirety of the Sinestro Corps, what Sinestro himself is doing is marshalling his own abilities. And this is so sweet because I don't think I've ever seen anything like this before. Now, again, I'm not as well versed in the Green Lantern mythos as I imagine a lot of you all are, but I've never really seen anything like this before. Sinestro starts marshalling the power available to him, you know, absorbing the power of the fear engine to the point that he boosts his ring to a thousand percent power level. That is insane. And so what this seems to be doing, or at least what this seems to, to happen with regards to what Robert Venditti is telling us is that Sinestro and Hal Jordan seem to be even. Not only that, I think it also gives us a perspective of what Hal Jordan's capable of in the sense that, you know, with, with Sinestro marshalling his power to the point that his ring is 1000% above its normal capacity, its normal charge, a 100% charge, that with Hal Jordan going against him and still being able to hold his own, it tells us that whatever this power is, that with Hal Jordan becoming a living construct, that his power is equal to about a thousand percent of a normal power ring. And so it's, it's insane the kind of level, that the, the kind of energy that he possesses. Now, really the fault of Sinestro here is he sits down and he says, look, like Hal Jordan, you've constantly been a thorn in my side. Since I first met you, I, you've been nothing but a letdown. But in truth, this has never been the case. Hal Jordan has always been one of the best of the Green Lanterns. The reason why Sinestro says this is partly because I would imagine Sinestro can't admit to himself that Hal Jordan may very well be greater than he is. There's a huge debate that goes on in the Green Lantern fan base. Who's better, Sinestro or Hal Jordan? And I'm not even, <laughs> I'm not even going to touch that. In fact, post a comment. I want to know who you guys think is better, Hal Jordan or Sinestro. If uh, if anybody's going to get screamed at that, screamed out for that it ain't gonna be me that's good you guys are gonna have to scream at each other i'm not even gonna poke that bull but the fact remains that this basically brings in the entire history of the two of them. And what I mean here is ever since, again, you know, Hal Jordan first became a Green Lantern, ever since he was chosen by the Ring of Abin Sur, and ever since he first became, or first crossed paths with Sinestro and was taught how to be a Green Lantern, there's always been this rivalry. The two of them have fought over the years, the two of them have been allies over the years. But the fact remains that there's always been this animosity between the two. And what Robert Venditti seems to be doing is basically giving us this creme de la creme of conflicts. This sort of end-all, be-all, grand poobah, Hal Jordan versus Sinestro, title fight, 15 rounds battle. And the great thing about this is that it seems to be the height of their powers. I mean, like this shot right here of Hal Jordan and Sinestro, chest out, fighting each other, is amazing <laughs> because you you have Sinestro at 1000% normal power. You have Hal Jordan, who for all intents and purposes is becoming a living construct. These, at least at this moment right now, seem to be the two most powerful lanterns in existence. And so it seems to be this quintessential question of what happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object. And so what happens is we transition here back to Guy Gardner. This is why I say the power of hope is such a huge thing. Knowing that Hal Jordan is out there fighting, even if he's only fighting alone, knowing that Hal Jordan is out there and doing his best to protect the universe as best he can allows not only Guy Gardner to marshal his own abilities, to marshal his own strength of character, but it'll, it influences everybody else around him. This shows us the power of the Green Lanterns, not just in creating physical constructs, not just in, you know, being able to fly and engage in really cool battles and stuff. It shows us the power of the Green Lanterns in the hearts and minds of the universe's citizens, because he starts running off the Green Lantern Oath, in brightest day, in blackest night, and everybody else starts reciting it as well. You know, no evil shall escape their might. Let those who worship evil's might be where their power, green lanterns light. And everybody says it. Everyone who's hooked up to the fear engine says it. Every single person. And because of this, their willpower is able to fight off fear. And because it's able to fight off fear, the fear engine is no longer able to manipulate their minds. And it basically begins reducing the power of the Sinestro core. It reduces the power of, of Sinestro himself. And so because of this, because this power begins to drop off, it's effectively inevitable that Sinestro was going to be defeated. Now, ultimately, this also leads to Guy Gardner marshalling the rest of the Sinestro core members who are avidly standing against Sinestro, fighting on behalf of what remains of the Green Lantern core, or at the very least, living up to their previous position. But because of the power that, that Hal Jordan possesses here, because of his capabilities and basically being a living construct, Sinestro doesn't realize what's going on. And initially Sinestro says, stop, you have to stop this. Because at this point, Sinestro, I think, begins to realize what Hal Jordan is now, that Hal Jordan's not just a Green Lantern, guys. He's not just a guy running around with a power ring, that Hal Jordan is now becoming a living construct. His power dwarfs 
that of Sinestro. In addition, Sinestro's faced with his own mortality, and this comes to fruition when Hal Jordan lets off all the energy that he possesses, when he lets off all this power that he has, and in doing so, destroys Warworld and seems to kill Sinestro in the process. Now, I wouldn't swear that as being an absolute truth, but it seems as though he's killed Sinestro. And so, in a little bit of humor here, <laughs> in a little bit of, of, of humor with this, Robert Venditti still has Jon Stewart and the Green Lantern Corps heading, going headlong into the conflict, but it's already done. <laughs> it's already over. They don't even get to fight, <laughs> which is the saddest thing ever. But they are met by the arrival, I guess as the story comes to an end, they are met by the arrival of Guy Gardner, uh, who's being protected by you know, of course, the daughter of Sinestro with her power ring, as well as those members of the Sinestro Corps who worked against Sinestro and who are now allying themselves with the Green Lantern Corps itself. Okay, so I held on as long as I could, but reading the new uh, Green Lantern's story, uh, basically training day is what it is, it's essentially like the whole training story with uh, Simon Baz and Jessica Cruz, we have to start going over Hal Jordan and the Green Lanterns. Now, we already did Sinestro's Law, which is the opening story for Hal Jordan and the Green Lanterns. Robert Venditti, you are an amazing guy. Okay, check this out, guys. You're never gonna believe this story. So so we're in Chicago for C2E2. Myself and Benny, a uh, comic historian, are hanging out with Robert Venditti. We were talking about something, I can't remember what it was, was. No, I was trying to convince him to tell me something that happens in Hal Jordan and the Green Lanterns, an event that seems like it's leading into Watchmen, and he wouldn't tell me what it was. And so he was like, aren't you the guy that got on Twitter and was like, hey, everybody, like, what's your favorite story from DC Rebirth and why is it Superman? And I was like, no, man, I was just messing around. <laughs> It was pretty fun. He's a really, really cool guy. He's really fun to hang out with. But uh, but anyway, so with regards to Hal Jordan and the Green Lanterns, uh, what we saw in the first storyline was the de facto death of Hal Jordan. Now, Sinestro also seemed to have died too, but we don't really know what happened to him. And in fact, here we really focus on uh, we focus on Hal Jordan. Now, the cool thing is that for those of you guys who are keeping up with my videos on uh, Jeff John's Green Lantern run, a lot of the stuff that we're going over will start to become more and more familiar to you the more we cover Jeff John's run. So it's kind of cool here. For example, uh, the daughter of Sinestro is the one running the Sinestro Corps now. So those are the kind of things that we start to get into, the kind of things that begin to make sense to you guys. So again, it's really kind of a self-fulfilling thing. Now, those of you guys who are watching my Jeff Johns Green Lantern videos, what we're going to do is we're going to throw this in to the Jeff Johns video, but we're constantly going to bump these back as we put in new information. So these will always be at the very end until we begin to, you know, sort of fill out and, and so on and so forth. But the fact remains here, with the end of uh, Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern's Sinestro's Law, we kind of saw something that we never really seen before. What we ended up getting was basically Hal Jordan's ring, uh, which was made completely by him. Now, we'll talk about that here in a second, but of course, what we also do is we have, you know, Jon Stewart, who's basically leading the Green Lantern Corps, and the daughter of Sinestro, who's leading the Sinestro Corps. And what they've done is essentially come together, because remember, at the end of uh, really kind of going into the New 52, at the tail end of Jeff John's run, and picking up with Robert Vendetti's run, we basically had this whole scenario where the Guardians of the Universe were almost completely and totally obliterated, with the exception of Gan it and saved. They were just kind of exiled out into the middle of nowhere. They've been gone the entire time. Jon Stewart and the other Green Lanterns uh, were essentially kind of ousted beyond all known existence and kind of taken all the way back to the very beginning of the universe's origin. And what it did is it set the stage for the Sinestro Corps to basically have run of the land. They could essentially implement their own law, you know, operating under the guise of being protectors and then force the universe into enslavement. Of course, this basically resulted in the Green Lanterns kind of coming back, or at least it was a very uh, coincidental timely thing. They came back, they fought against the uh, the Sinestro Corps, and Sinestro supposedly died. And so because of that, we basically have these two cores operating together. The issue is that despite the fact they're really kind of in shambles, or they're really just kind of hanging on by the skin of their teeth, at the end of the day, they are Green Lanterns, and they are the universe's police force. And so they grab what numbers they have, they grab the Sinestro Corps, and they take off to Sector 2813, uh, which is basically the whole Vegas sector, for the purpose of responding to a threat. Now, of course, we end up finding out this threat comes in the form of Starro. Now, this this is a great throwback. This is a really, really cool throwback. Starro is a filler villain, right? <laughs> Starro is the guy you bring in when you're launching a new story and you want to show what the team is about. Uh, Starro was the original villain of the Justice League of America when they were first created in 1960. He's the very first villain of the Justice League, and he really kind of has a special place in the legacy of DC Comics because of that. So he's like the guy that's been at the job for like 30 years and now he just doesn't ever do anything, but nobody fires him because he's paid his dues. That's really kind of what happens with Starro here. I mean, it's He's 
the guy on the couch, more or less. You know, and, and, and it's, it's things like this. I think it's really, you know, these these small little moments, these, these little great things that make Hal Jordan and the Green Lanterns the best thing come out of DC Rebirth because it's just these great little tidbits of history that get thrown and get kind of brought into this story. Now, of course, with Starro effectively vanishing, you know, essentially disappearing, what ends up happening is the Green Lanterns, you know, essentially try to chase after him only to find out that they've been contained and they're held inside one of the jars of Brainiac. Now, this is really kind of cool because again, Brainiac's big claim to fame is that he just goes around putting things in containers. Now, we know from our, our Injustice, uh, Injustice origin videos for Brainiac because we basically just grabbed the New 52 origin, which you'll find down in the description. We know a lot of this was rooted in the idea that he was basically trying to save the universe or save, you know, all things in existence from a warring race outside of, you know, from another dimension. But the fact remains here that his big thing is just traveling around the cosmos, grabbing things that are interesting, bottling them up, and then just holding them in place. And so effectively, the Green Lanterns and the Sinestro Corps are stuck inside a giant jar as it's being held by Brainiac, which is kind of cool. But again, picking up with Hal Jordan's Green Lantern ring, uh, we end up finding out that after he died, the ring eventually sought out Ganthet and Say. Now, the reason why this matters is because of the fact that Green Lantern rings do not do this. Remember, uh, Ganthet and Say have just kind of been outside of everything. They really have no idea what's been going on for the most part. I mean, they have a general idea. They have a general understanding. But to their knowledge, they didn't know that Hal Jordan was dead. Not only that, they didn't know that Hal Jordan forged his own ring. Under normal circumstances, in the Green Lantern mythos, say, for example, there's, you know, Sector 2814, which is the location of Earth in the uh, in the DC universe, what usually ends up happening is a Green Lantern will die. And then it'll say, okay, Green Lantern of Sector 2814 is dead, searching out a new Lantern. And it'll immediately just hunt down a brand new Lantern. That person will be selected. They'll be told, you know, you have the power to overcome great fear. They will be selected to become a Green Lantern and they'll be whisked off to what would normally be Oa, the base of operations for the, uh, for the Green Lanterns. Right now it's Mogo, the giant Green Lantern planet, but they'll be whisked off in order to go through the training process and be brought into, you know, to being a Green Lantern. The difference here is that this ring is explicitly looking for Hal Jordan, and that has never happened before. It's one of the coolest things to take place in the whole Green Lantern landscape. And so what we're going to do here is for the most part, the, the whole events with, uh, you know, the, the early conflict with the Green Lanterns is really just kind of them facing off against, you know, Starro and the little mini stars that he's used to basically take over the minds of different people. That's not wildly important. I mean, it's, it's, it's there and it's something to be read, but what Robert Vendetti is really doing here is emphasizing Hal Jordan. It's really kind of like the Green Lanterns are a secondary plot to what's going on with Hal. With regards to his ring searching explicitly for him, what we end up doing is we actually pick up with him in the afterlife. Now, he gets these little glimpses and different things like that, and it's kind of cool to see this because it's kind of Vendetti taking his own stance on what happens when a person dies, and it's been depicted different ways over the course of DC Comics publication history, but here, it's almost like an afterlife explicitly for the Green Lanterns, and that's not unheard of. I mean, the Speed Force is the afterlife for the Flashes for speedsters in the DC Universe. In Marvel Comics, people from Asgard who die honorably, they go to Valhalla. Uh, Again, like, there's a lot of different things that go on with regards to how it is that death is depicted in comic books. And it's always kind of cool to see, you know, an individual's own depiction on the realm of death. But in his journey, Hal Jordan basically comes across Abin Sur. Now, this, again, is a really great moment of history here because that's what this is designed to be. Hal Jordan and the Green Lanterns is designed to pay so much homage to all the work that was done both by Vendetti himself and by Jeff Johns. And so the idea is to basically give us a lot of these great little hallmark moments. Now, of course, essentially with what appears to be the defeat of Starro, you know, the various little mini Starros kind of fall off the faces of the people who have been captured and so on and so forth. And again, we're just kind of touching back on that little bit of a conflict here and there so you guys can sort of understand what's going on. But the fact remains, speaking directly with Abin Sur, what seems to be happening is Abin Sur is effectively easing Hal Jordan's passing. Now, this is really kind of cool and it seems like something that you would expect right? I mean, I don't really think about death very often, you know, but I have thought about scenarios of what would happen when the time comes where I pass on. And I always thought it would be kind of a, a cool idea if you encounter someone who kind of takes you on this journey, who takes you on this path that helps to ease the transition between your living and the fact that you're in the afterlife now. Uh, because I imagine it'd be a pretty jarring experience to suddenly just be dead. Well, that's that, you know, and... <laughs> <laughs> just gonna be whisked away, you know, to some place or something along those lines. But the fact remains here, you know, with, with regards to Abin Sur, the whole idea of kind of easing Hal Jordan's passing also comes with the notion that Hal Jordan shouldn't be here. And that's what's kind of crazy is because of all the people that could have appeared to Hal Jordan, it's Abin Sur. And so while he's kind of here to say, hey, look, man, like you're in the afterlife, just so you know, <laughs> you basically died. You know, the idea is to say, look, man, right now is not your time. 
you are not supposed to be dead. You are supposed to be alive. Now, this doesn't mean that Amon Sor can see the future. You know, it doesn't mean that he's, you know, a guy that knows everything that's going to happen later on down the line. What it does mean is that Hal Jordan is going to play a very intrinsic part in the events to come. Because keep in mind, everything in DC Comics is leading up to, you know, the whole reveal of the Watchmen and all that kind of good stuff. And that's really what's going on right now. And, you know, the Green Lanterns by Sam Humphreys, you know, the reason why we're kind of going back and covering all this stuff is because we basically have the Green Lantern, Simon Baz and Jessica Cruz showing up to receive training alongside Guy Gardner and Kyle Rayner. And so they're basically going to step into the role of being tried and true Green Lanterns because all these numbers are being consolidated. All these different superhero teams are being brought together. Armies are being raised. All these preparations for war are being made with regards to the DC landscape. If you look, that's exactly what's happening. Superman's consolidated with his new 52 power and he's stronger than he ever was. All the Green Lanterns are being recalled back to Oa. You have all these different things taking place, especially with the button. I'm not going to spoil anything because it just came out and it's really, really good. But all these things are taking place for the purpose of consolidating numbers. And so what is up happening is Ganthan and Sade basically reach out and they yank Kyle Rayner. They bring Kyle Rayner over to the location. Now keep in mind, Kyle Rayner is the White Lantern. And so he can literally reach into the afterlife and pull Hal Jordan out. But the crazy thing is that as is depicted here, it's contingent on the mindset of the person who's already there. And so Hal Jordan is in a very confused state. He doesn't know what's going on. I mean, he's being told, yes, you know, this is, this is not your time. You are not supposed to pass on yet. But for him, he's also kind of accepting to a degree. I mean, he's like, you know, I don't really know where I am, but he's not panicking. He's not freaking out. It's nothing like that. You know, it's him basically just kind of like, yeah, I guess maybe this is the afterlife. You know, he's calm. He's relaxed. He's not panicking and clamoring his way back to life again. And so because of that, where he does meet all these other members of the Green Lanterns who have died, you know, Tomar Ray and, and all these various individuals. And it is really cool to see that the fact remains here that Kyle Rayner essentially uses his power, reaches into the ring that is Hal Jordan's and tries to bring him back. Now, that's the cool thing because the ring is what anchors Hal Jordan to the possibility of continuing to live. The ring is what anchors him there. It's almost as if, you know, for example, you had fallen down into a hole and you were just holding on to the edge. Somebody can grab your hand and they can pull you back up. And that's exactly what Kyle Rayner is doing with Hal Jordan's ring. Had Hal Jordan not forge this ring out of his willpower, all of his essence would essentially be gone with him because this is, again, just a small essence of what Hal Jordan is. It allows uh, Kyle Rayner to reach in to the ring itself and pull Hal Jordan out. And that's exactly what he does. And that's one of the coolest things to see is him basically resurrecting Hal Jordan, bringing Hal Jordan back. Now, of course, once Hal Jordan is here, we also end up finding out that where Brainiac is going around and gathering up all these different artifacts and putting them in containers, that, that while this is a normal trend of Brainiac, Brainiac himself Itself is actually being controlled by Larflees. Now, there are Green Lantern fans out there who love Larflees. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, yes, Larflees. You know, there are people who love Larflees. He's got so much character. He's such a cool character. So here's the deal. Larflees taps into the uh, to the emotional spectrum of avarice, or really the emotion of avarice in the emotional spectrum, i.e. greed. He is the greediest lantern <laughs> in, the, in, in the universe. It, it, it's such a cool concept too, because if you're the green lantern that taps into the emotion of greed, you would be the only lantern, right? I mean, if you were the, the, the orange lantern rather that taps into the emotional spectrum of greed, you'd be the only lantern. And he is. He keeps his central power, or he keeps his uh, power battery in close check. His central power battery is in close check. Everything that he values is just kind of hoarded because that's what he is. He's a hoarder. He's a, he's a guy that just hoards stuff. But the other half of this is the Orange Lantern Corps. There is no Orange Lantern Corps per se, simply because of the fact that Larflees keeps himself as the only one with an Orange Lantern ring. Instead, what he does is those individuals that he kills, he in turn makes constructs out of. He effectively captures their essence and makes them into constructs. And so it's really kind of a twisted scenario and it would be a fate worse than death to be taken by Larflees. But what he ended up doing was basically stumbling across one of the old designs or the old builds, uh, builds of Brainiac. Now, in truth, Venditti can just kind of get away with this, to be honest. I mean, there's been so many versions of Brainiac that have appeared over the years and so many versions that have been defeated. We would kind of have to believe that some older model, some obsolete version of Brainiac is just kind of laying in a junk heap somewhere in the universe. I mean, it just makes sense. I mean, it, it really just kind of makes good sense with this character. But what ends up happening is because of the fact that Brainiac exists to basically capture, catalog, and store objects, Larflees takes Brainiac, makes him his own, and the two of them just begin going around for the purpose of capturing artifacts for Larflees to just hoard things. And that's kind of a cool idea. It's a cool blending of 
like-minded things in the sense that Brainiac does exactly what Larflees does. The only difference is that Brainiac doesn't have a lantern ring, which seeing Brainiac with a lantern ring would be kind of cool. But again, Brainiac's just kind of serving his purpose here. And so of course, with Hal Jordan uh, having been dead, or at least, you know, having died without having been aware of the fact that Jon Stewart and the other lanterns had arrived, with Kyle Rayner being there and kind of having been this shepherd throughout the universe, really kind of helping worlds thrive and grow and so on, he basically tells Hal Jordan, look, the Green Lantern Corps is back. And so Hal Jordan immediately races off alongside uh, Kyle Rayner and Gantha to say, now remember, uh, with regards to the to the return of the Green Lanterns, I wouldn't go as far as to say that it's like Gantha and Sade basically saying, yeah, things are going to be just like they were before. It's not going to be like that. <laughs> it's not going to be that way. But what it will do is it will offer a return to normalcy. And the reason why is because of the fact that when almost all the guardians of the universe were completely destroyed by Sinestro, who was possessed by the Parallax entity at the time, what he did is he left Gantha and Sade alive, basically allowing them to experience emotions, guilt, remorse, different things like that, shame for the different actions they'd been involved in over the course of their time as guardians of the universe and allowed them to stay in isolation. Returning back, you know, with the reformation of the Green Lanterns means that Ganthan and Sade can bring those experiences with them. They can kind of walk away from this idea that emotion is a weakness and instead see it for what it is, something that could help them make more rational decisions than if they were emotionless. Now, of course, again, this really kind of begs the question on, you know, which one was better, whether they had emotions or when they didn't have emotions. And in fact, only time will tell with regards to this story. Uh, but the fact remains here, you know, with Hal Jordan, with Kyle Rayner, with Ganthet Sade basically showing up to Mogo, Mogo basically says, look, yes, they're using me as a base of operations. They were recalled to another sector to deal with a conflict and then all communications basically vanished. Now it's just the search is on for the Green Lantern Corps. The search is on to basically find them and the Sinestro Corps. Now, again, Hal Jordan does not know that the Green Lantern Corps and the Sinestro Corps have joined forces. He's not aware of that. In his mind, there's just the Green Lantern Corps. Now, from here, what we actually have is a really, really good instance of Jon Stewart showing his chops when it comes to being a good leader. And this is one of the reasons why I really think that it's high time that Jon Stewart got his time in the sun, because I think Venditti is doing a great job with regards to his character, because with Jon Stewart effectively leading everything, you get to see how capable he is. Now, in truth, under Jeff Johns, you know, all the lanterns of Earth got their time. I mean, they really got their time in the sun. They got a chance to, for us as the reader, to experience them. But I think that in terms of Jon Stewart being a tried and true leader of the Green Lanterns, I don't really think that Edge of Oblivion showed that for what it was. I don't think it really showed him, you know, for being as capable of a leader as he is, especially now that he has to work alongside basically his sworn enemy, the Sinestro Corps. And so what Jon Stewart basically says is, look, I know Larflees. I know what he's about. Larflees prizes his possessions. Larflees only cares about the objects that he has. If he begins losing those, he'll do almost anything to get them back. He'll just snatch things up. He'll do whatever it is that he has to. And so what Jon Stewart says is our plan should be to work alongside each other and basically fight each other. Now, again, this is really kind of cool because we in turn have the Brainiac Android feeding on this. The Brainiac Android basically says, look, man, like they're going to, they're going to go against each other and they are going to lead to their destruction. But here's the deal. You can catalog all different kinds of events. I mean, some of these things are irreplaceable. Some of these things simply cannot be stopped. You can't bring them back. You just don't have the power to do that. And so at the risk of losing the Sinestro Corps entirely or losing the Green Lantern Corps in its entirety, uh, Larflees basically lashes out and destroys the bottle in which they're held, which of course leads to them, uh, at least the Sinestro Corps and the Green Lantern Corps fighting against the constructs of Larflees. Now, you know, with Hal Jordan stepping in, you know, Hal Jordan arriving, Kyle Rayner arriving, for a lot of fans, this was a return to the familiarity they've been looking for for so long. I mean, we would get this great full page splash of Jon Stewart and, and Kyle Rayner and Hal Jordan and Guy Gardner the four top Green Lanterns of Earth. And, and a lot of fans really kind of looked at this and said, this is the Green Lanterns. These are the Green Lanterns that I know, the Green Lanterns I grew up with, the Green Lanterns that I love. And Venditti did not do this by accident. This was not an accidental thing. These four, for the most part, are the Green Lanterns. They, alongside all the other respective fans of these Green Lanterns, will say they are the top Lanterns. Now, a crowd is growing for Jessica Cruz, and a crowd is growing for, for Simon Bass. And this is most certainly being helped by Sam Humphrey's amazing writing and the Green Lantern stories. But in terms of the Lanterns as we know them, those are the ones that they think of. Those are the ones that they believe to be the top Lanterns. Now, of course, this also leads directly into the, the Green Lantern Corps and the Sinestro Corps merging into a singular core. Again, Hal Jordan is still pretty new to all this, so he really hasn't had, had a whole lot of time to ask questions and to figure out what's going on. Instead, we just kind of get a singular Lantern Corps, which is really going to be kind of cool. But what this does is this basically leads into the return of St. Walker 
the Blue Lantern. Somebody understand, somebody, somebody explain this to me. Why do you guys like Saint Walker so much? And please don't say because he's awesome. That doesn't answer anything. I wanna know why Saint Walker is so cool. Why do people love him? It's a cool name. Saint Walker is an awesome name, but people love Saint Walker and I just don't understand why. Okay, so getting into uh, Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps, the quest for hope. The funny thing about this is that I accidentally deleted this recording. Like I had this already done and everything and then I accidentally deleted it. And I was like, no, because I tried all my recovery software in order to get it back and I couldn't find it. And I was like, oh my God. So I've got to go back and re-record it. But the cool thing is that this is kind of par for the course. Like I usually record audios a couple of times to make sure that I get all the points across, you know, that I want to make. But for those of you guys who are new to the Green Lantern landscape, the way that DC Rebirth has done Green Lantern is in two different ways. We have Green Lantern's Rebirth, which is basically the new fan's guide to Green Lanterns. You literally learn about the Green Lantern mythos as, uh, as Simon Baz and Jessica Cruz learn about it. Then there's Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps, and that's more for established fans. All it really did when Green, I guess when Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps Rebirth kicked off is it continued a lot of the stories that it just kind of had dangling plot threads at the end of Jeff John's run going into Robert Venditti's run, and so that was a goal to basically wrap those things up up. And so what happened is Robert Venditti began the process of writing his own stories of basically saying, here's everything that I'm creating for the very first time. And it's really, really cool because it comes together almost seamlessly. You could just follow the entire story because again, Green Lantern as it stands right now is this massive 10 years long worth of just events. It's just this massive cosmology. But the idea here is that this initially picks up with a guy named Space Cabby. Now, the funny thing about this is that Space Cabby is not new. Space Cabby has been around for a long time, but this fits directly in line with the nature of DC Rebirth, which is to say that we're basically talking about this point where DC is grabbing characters that had been around for a very long time, whether they were obscure, whether they were really popular, and basically either updating them or keeping them the same if they were that familiar. For example, Wally West, the classic Flash, came back and he's basically the same. When it comes to a character like Space Cabby, he's about as obscure as it gets. <laughs> this guy first popped up back in 1954 with uh, Mystery in Space number 21, I think it was. I want to say he was an auto bender creation, but I'm not going to swear to that. But the idea was that Space Cabby is exactly what he sounds like. He's a guy that ferries people across the universe. Now, DC kind of delves into these things periodically, and it's really just designed to kind of bolster the cosmic landscape of DC Comics. That was the original purpose of Space Cabby, and that's the purpose he serves now. For the most part, whenever it comes to the cosmos, Green Lantern is about as extensive as it gets. We don't really see a whole lot of other stories out there that deal with like the cosmic landscape of DC. They're not like Marvel. Marvel, you'll read Guardians of the Galaxy, you'll read Captain Marvel, depending on who's writing it, you can read Thanos, you'll get this huge, well-rounded space, you know, exploration, and in fact, the spacefaring escapades of the various characters that exist out there are usually done just as much as the Earth-based events. So you're just as likely to see a story of Captain America fighting the Red Skull as you are to see Thanos trying, you know, fighting against Galactus and, like, overpowering him, which he did, and it was an amazing story. <laughs> but the idea here is that Space Cabby was a guy who's basically done everything. Thing. I mean, he's been a soldier of fortune. He's just been a fairy man. He's done all kinds of stuff. He lends his abilities to the highest bidder. The reason why he's in the story is because this ties in to the existing events that are going on in Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps. If you're just now joining the events, what effectively had happened is that we had basically Sinestro and Hal Jordan fighting one another for what was believed to be the last time. That was the idea. They've been enemies for so long. DC Rebirth was designed to kind of make a return to familiarity, but also begin moving things in a different direction. And the whole Sinestro as a backdrop, a villain to Hal Jordan, that had been going on for decades and decades and decades. And so it made sense that DC would come along and say, let's go ahead and back off and let's try something new. And so in the very first story arc of Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps called Sinestro's Law, Hal Jordan and Sinestro fought and they were both basically killed. Now the idea is that following the death of Sinestro, his daughter Saronic took up his mantle. Now if you're following our Green Lantern videos on Sunday, which is when we cover all the classic Green Lantern stuff that leads into DC Rebirth, what we know is that Saronic, as the daughter of Sinestro, was originally a member of the Green Lantern Corps. The issue is that eventually she became a member of the Sinestro Corps, but during Hal Jordan the Green Lantern Rebirth, with the death of Sinestro, she took up her father's mantle. But instead of being a bad guy, what she did is she worked directly alongside Jon Stewart and brought the Green Lanterns and the Sinestro Corps together. Now, with regards to the Green Lanterns themselves, this again fits into a lot of the stuff that was leading in to DC Rebirth. What had happened is that there was basically a story called Edge of Oblivion, I think it was, 
there was. And it was essentially the Green Lanterns just kind of being catapulted, or at least what was left of the Green Lanterns, being catapulted all the way back to the very beginning of the universe. And the result was that in the present day, there were no Green Lanterns. The result was that Sinestro saw it as his chance to basically take the Sinestro Corps, have it masquerade as a peacekeeping force, all for the purpose of basically building on people believing in them. The idea was that once people looked to the Sinestro Corps as their protectors, Sinestro would betray them, he would instill fear, and then conquer the universe. But all that basically came to a head during Hal Jordan the Green Lantern Corps rebirth with Sinestro's Law. And so again, what this means is that at this point in the story, we basically have a strange situation. You have basically a lot of the members of the Sinestro Corps who despise the Green Lanterns, and you've got a lot of members of the Green Lanterns who despise the Sinestro Corps because they've been fighting for so long. Remember, when the Sinestro Corps first showed up, and again, I have Sinestro Corps War down in the description, you're welcome to check it out. When the Sinestro Corps first popped up, they started slaughtering Green Lanterns everywhere they saw them. It was an absolute bloodbath. It wasn't until it got to the point where it looked like Sinestro was going to win that the Guardians of the Universe adjusted the, the laws of the rings, allowing Green Lanterns to kill members of the Sinestro Corps. That turned the tide, and the Green Lanterns ended up winning the war, or at least they basically defeated the Sinestro Corps. But the idea is that following the defeat of Sinestro and all this kind of stuff that's going on right now, what this basically means is that the Green Lanterns and the Sinestro Corps have a very tenuous relationship, to say the least. But in that first story arc, with the death of Hal Jordan, what we found out was that Kyle Rayner as the White Lantern had essentially resurrected him. Now remember, as the White Lantern, Kyle Rayner has mastery over all the rings. He can do anything. I mean, he's basically God in DC's universe. And that's something that I want you to, to keep in mind for a second, because once we get to the end of this video, it's really going to showcase just how powerful Dr. Manhattan is. But the idea here is that with Hal Jordan having died, because he was kind of a rallying point for the Green Lanterns, what this meant was that the Guardians of the Universe needed him, or at least what was left of the Guardians, Ganthet and Sade, they needed him alive. And so getting with Kyle Rayner, having him reach into the afterlife and bring Hal Jordan back, while Hal Jordan was there among the dead, he had spoke with his predecessor, Abin Sur, the guy who had given Hal Jordan his very first ring. And Abin Sur's statement was pretty uh, cryptic, to say the least, but he had simply just said, go find hope. Now, the initial indication here was that it meant go find the Blue Lanterns. And so what ends up happening is Hal, uh, Hal Jordan, alongside Kyle Rayner, basically race off to a place called the Misery Mound. Now, the Misery Mound is basically just kind of a mountain, you know, occupied by all these creatures and so on that exists for the purpose of just stripping people of their desire for hope. And that's the necessity. That's the nature of the Misery Mound. When it comes to the Blue Lanterns, of course, I imagine a lot of this might be new to people who are stumbling across this, but when it comes to the Blue Lanterns, they are a Lantern Corps predicated on hope. And they're probably the most powerful just because hope is the only thing that people can have that will allow them to do anything else. With people like you know, Atrocitus, for example, Atrocitus as the head of the Red Lantern Corps feels nothing but rage, but his rage is predicated on the hope that he can succeed in destroying all the other Lantern Corps in existence. So again, everything boils down to hope. And that's the reason why it is the Blue Lanterns are so powerful. But when the Lantern Corps were created by Jeff Johns back when he was doing his massive run, every Lantern Corps had to have a caveat, which is to say they had to have a weakness. And so the idea is that with the Blue Lanterns, they function at their absolute peak when they're accompanied by a Green Lantern. And that's why this is important is because St. Walker as the last remaining Blue Lantern is powerful in his own right, but his power is bolstered and complemented by the Green Lanterns. And so with the arrival of Hal Jordan alongside Kyle Rayner, what this does is it basically begins the process of beefing up the abilities of the Blue Lantern Corps, beefing up the abilities of St. Walker. The problem with this is that when it comes to Blue Lanterns, and the reason why this misery mound is really happening is because Blue Lanterns have to constantly feel hope. That brings us into the idea of the Blue Lanterns basically falling, of being eradicated. There was a story that was written, and I cannot remember what it was called for the life of me, but it dealt with a villain named Relic. And Relic was a guy who had come from a previous universe where the emotional spectrum had basically run rampant and then eventually just kind of went away. And the result was that all life in the universe, if I remember correctly, had basically gone. The result of this is that he had shown up in the main DC universe for the purpose of exterminating all the Lantern Corps, keeping their power from running awry, and then forcing the same result of his universe. The first Lantern Corps that he targeted were the Blue Lanterns. Now, the Blue Lanterns were the easiest to target because despite how powerful they were, if at any point a Blue Lantern does not feel hope, their ring will take off. Their ring will leave them hanging and they'll just be as powerless as anybody else. Woe betide them if their ring leaves them while they're in the depths of space and they can't breathe. So because of that, during this whole skirmish where the Blue Lanterns were basically just falling left and right, Saint Walker was the last guy left. Ultimately, Saint Walker lost connection with his Blue Lantern ring and the Blue Lanterns were 
were no more. Now, eventually he regained it. And what that did is it went into DC Rebirth. The problem was that when DC Rebirth first kicked off, we didn't know what St. Walker was doing. We had no idea where he was or what was going on. There was no information on his character. What this reveals is that he's basically been off fighting the Misery Mound. And the Misery Mound serves a purpose of trying to relinquish people of their hope, of trying to exterminate all hope in their entirety. Now, again, because this is pretty new in relation to DC Rebirth, which is to say we're about a year and a half, two years out from DC Rebirth in terms of the lead up, the main event itself, all that kind of good stuff. A lot of folks are still jumping into Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps for the very first time. And so because of this, we're basically picking up into the idea of people learning about all this for the first time. And that's why this Misery Mound is here, to basically give people who are reading for the first time an understanding of what the Blue Lanterns are about. Now, the idea here is that with Hal Jordan and with Kyle Rayner basically being subdued by the Misery Mound, it shows us what it does. And again, the Misery Mound exists for the purpose of just taking people's hope away. But it's not like an energy thing, right? Like it's not like it attaches these tendrils and says, now I'm stripping you of your hope. Instead, it's very much similar to like the Black Mercy plants, for example. You attach a Black Mercy plant to a person and they just see their perfect dreams forever and ever and ever. And they're basically just held prisoner until they die. With regards to this, a person is basically forced to see the one thing that they love the most, the one thing they would love to see happen. And then that beautiful future is transformed into a nightmare. In the case of Hal Jordan, he has a family, he has children, he has Carol Ferris at his side. And then suddenly that shifts into a nightmare where he goes back to being a villain and just everybody around him dies. When it comes to Kyle Rayner, he's basically the White Lantern. He's effectively DC's space Jesus. Because of that, he sees himself as a savior of all life, as a representation of all life, being a protector in the most definitive statement. The problem with this is his nightmare is falling down and becoming parallax, becoming a villain. Now remember, with these characters, they've experienced this kind of thing before. Kyle Rayner, did become Parallax, the living embodiment of fear during Sinestro Corps War. Hal Jordan has lost almost everything he cared about in some form or fashion, friends, family, loved ones, a whole nine yards. And so the idea is that with them basically experiencing this horrible nightmare, St. Walker as a Blue Lantern begins to empower them with hope. And in doing so, allows them to basically break free of the Misery Mound. So again, this Misery Mound is pretty powerful, but it's really the emotional connection that exists between these three lanterns that makes them able to to beat the Misery Mound in the first place. Now, following this, it goes into a whole explanation of, hey, the Guardians of the Universe sent me out here in order to basically make sure that I could find hope, that kind of a thing. Because remember, Ganthet and Sade as the Guardians of the Universe were the ones who made the Blue Lantern Rings in the first place. Now, their goal in terms of why it is that Hal Jordan came and why it is that Kyle Rayner came, again, hits back to the nature of the Blue Lantern Rings. Blue Lantern Rings can only function at their peak if they're accompanied by a Green Lantern Ring. And so having Hal Jordan there was one, because of the fact that he's the one that got the message from Abbott and sore, but two, because if St. Walker is in danger, his lantern ring will bolster the power of St. Walker's ring. Now, Kyle Rayner being there is because as the guy who's basically the nature of life itself, he can resurrect the dead. The goal of the Guardians of the Universe, the goal of Ganthet and Sade, is to basically use uh, Kyle Rayner as the White Lantern to reach in and grab the life essences of those Blue Lanterns who perished from St. Walker and resurrect them from the dead. Using St. Walker as kind of an anchor to do so, to go into the afterlife, to grab those guys, say, hey, you have to come back. And so that's the whole nature of this. That's the whole purpose of this entire story in terms of those characters. Now, what ends up happening here is that once this really begins to go into effect, we get a massive glimpse of what it is that Dr. Manhattan can do. Now, it's not explicitly stated, but we're effectively told that's the case. When it comes to Kyle Rayner and when it comes to him speaking with the, the Guardians, once they begin the process of basically using Kyle to try to reach into the afterlife and grab these Blue Lanterns, it should have been seamless. Go into St. Walker's mind, grab the connections to the Blue Lanterns, speak with them, whatever it is that he had to do, and then bring bring them back. The problem with this is that someone gets in his way. Someone stops Kyle Rayner from being able to do this. We know that just because of the fact that the entire event come crashing down. Now, again, the biggest indication we're given here is that we run into St. Walker simply saying, I felt a presence, an intruder that was barring our path. Now, when it comes to the White Lantern in DC Comics, there are characters that can overpower him. I mean, like the presence, for example, probably the Spectre. You know, there's a few characters out there that could overpower the White Lantern because they're just that powerful. 
We have no reason to believe that the presence, the specter, the phantom stranger, hell, even Imperiax from the 1990s, we have no reason to believe that any of those characters have a reason to bar the path of White Lantern Kyle Rayner resurrecting the Blue Lanterns, resurrecting hope. The idea here is that Dr. Manhattan is the one that's keeping that from happening. And it all fits into the very notion of the Blue Lanterns themselves. The Blue Lanterns embody hope. The Blue Lanterns are insanely powerful. The other half of this is that this sees the destruction of the White Lantern rank. Kyle Rayner is no longer the White Lantern and there are no White Lanterns anymore. That's the important thing about this. That's the biggest takeaway from this. And the reason why is because let's say for example that Justice League versus Watchmen unfolds and we've got Dr. Manhattan fighting the Justice League. There's been times, so really I think it was during Blackest Night or Brightest Day, there was a point where the entire Justice League became White Lanterns. They were all as powerful as Kyle Rayner. The biggest issue this represents is that if Dr. Dr. Manhattan shows up and Dr. Manhattan had to fight all these White Lanterns, it would be epic and it would be cool, but most people would look at that and say, sure, he could probably defeat Kyle Rayner, but no way he could defeat like eight White Lanterns. That's ridiculous. And so why even go down that route? Why not just wipe out the White Lanterns in their entirety? That way you don't have to worry about this. The other half is that the White Lantern story arc of Kyle Rayner had basically reached his end. Kyle Rayner becoming the White Lantern was kind of this crescendo of his whole story. Going all the way back to to the mid-1990s with Emerald Twilight, Hal Jordan becoming a bad guy, destroying all the Green Lanterns, Ganthet showing up to Kyle Rayner and saying, you are the last of the Lanterns, here's a ring, use it wisely. All that led to Kyle Rayner becoming a White Lantern to this moment when he goes back to being who he was before. Because with the White Lantern ring being an amalgamation of all these other Lantern rings, what ends up happening is they all basically disperse. The White Lantern ring shatters, the other emotions form into their own rings, they disperse across the universe and they start looking for new hosts. The only exception to that is the Green Lantern ring, which rebonds itself to Kyle Rayner, setting him back to who he was before, before all of this stuff, you know, with the White Lantern ring all kicked out. And so the idea seems to be that he's kind of going back to the era of Ion, but at the very least, Kyle Rayner's character is going back to the beginning. It's kind of resetting everything back to zero to a degree. Now, it's not a reboot or anything like that. We'll probably see the White Lantern's return. That's the indication here. Dr. Manhattan is more powerful than the White Lanterns. That's the implication. But I'm kind of curious what you guys think. Do you guys think that's true? Do you think Dr. Manhattan is more powerful than a white lantern. I'm just kind of curious about that. Okay, so getting into uh, DC Rebirth, one of the funny things is I've been seeing comments recently of people asking me to do more DC videos. We literally alternate every other day. It's like Marvel, DC, Marvel, DC. Like Monday, Wednesday, and Friday are the Marvel days. Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday are the DC days. And then Saturday is when we do like Omega Beyond, Omega Level Mutants. So I don't really know what those guys are talking about. But with regards to Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps, remember this story deals more with like the Green Lantern Corps in space. And it's kind of interesting. I didn't even think about it until earlier today, but in DC Comics, you've always had like the Green Lantern Corps and then the Green Lantern books, or at least you did for a while. The Green Lantern Corps dealt with the Green Lantern characters outside of like Earth's Green Lanterns, basically. And then you had the Green Lantern stories, which dealt with Earth's Green Lanterns. So it was always kind of interesting. It was like the Superman action comics, you know, line of stories. But the idea here is that this basically gives us one set of events that essentially leads into another. And what this does is it basically creates what I like to call the Sinestro Corps civil war because that's basically what it is now initially this seems pretty straightforward right in the sense that there's basically some guy who works at a giant bank it's like one of these big cosmic banks that exist the biggest one in the universe is where a lot of like universal companies and things like that store their money the banks effectively robbed uh really well at least a campaign is being launched to rob this bank and the reason for that is because there's basically just a guy who works there and he's like whatever let's rob this place i mean there's no reason why we can't this of course leads into the green lantern corps now of course the green lantern corps at this moment in time serves as a police force of source. But remember, the Green Lanterns and the Sinestro Corps are basically merged into a singular group, which is kind of interesting because when the Sinestro Corps first popped up, they were the mortal enemies of the Green Lanterns. The idea though, was that the Sinestro Corps was led by Thal Sinestro. And the result is that once he was believed to have been killed in the first story arc of DC Rebirth, the leadership of the Sinestro Corps fell to his daughter, a former Green Lantern who joined the Yellow Lanterns. Now, of course, we're going back on Sundays and going through and explaining all that 
that Green Lantern mythos. And so if you're curious as to why that happens, all that comes out on Sundays. We're actually at Blackest Night at the moment, where it's like the rise of the Black Lantern Corps and all the dead superheroes are coming back to life. But the arrival of the Sinestro and Green Lantern Corps, again, they're really just more of a peacekeeping force. They basically grab these guys, they whisk them away, they're taken back to Mogo, the planet of the Green Lantern Corps, and they're basically made to stand trial. And that's really about it. The issue with this is that we end up finding out a member of the Green Lantern Corps is basically getting sick. Now, this Green Lantern is a guy by the name of Tomar II, and he's actually the son of Tomar Ray. The reason why I bring this up, and the reason why I'm kind of taking a second to talk about this, is because Tomar II and Tomar Ray have a pretty long standing history in the Green Lantern landscape, really more Tomar Ray than his son Tomar II. But the idea is that Tomar Ray was one of the original Green Lanterns, that is to say, one of the individuals who fought alongside Hal Jordan before he went crazy, was possessed by Parallax, and killed all the Green Lanterns. The result is that when Tomar II was given the ring of his father, there was some animosity when Hal Jordan returned during the events of the original Green Lantern rebirth. But as time progressed, Tomar II began to develop a kind of respect for Hal Jordan, and then eventually it became a mutual thing where Tomar II came to the realization that Hal Jordan had basically turned over a new leaf. He's proved himself time and time again in the Green Lantern stories to be one of the most important and best aspects of their team. Really this guy who in a lot of ways embodies what it means to be a Green Lantern. The reason why this is important actually becomes clear because it's the focal point of this story and the reason why everything ends up happening. And so what we do is we pick up with the aftermath of the last story that I believe we covered, the one called Prism of Time. It was basically the idea that Kyle Rayner's son had come from the future and then basically was able to possess pure willpower. The result is that he used his abilities to effectively destroy all the members of the Green Lanterns. These seem to be enemies of them. The result is that it ended up with Kyle Rayner facing off against his son and ultimately his son was killed. This is important because Kyle Rayner hid this fact from Saronic not to. Of course, Saronic being the daughter of, of uh, Thal Sinestro. Now, of course, Saronic is basically trying to escape her father's legacy, right? Like Thal Sinestro was a Green Lantern who abused his power. He fell to the dark side, so to speak, formed the Sinestro Corps and was an enemy of the Green Lanterns ever since. She's been trying to escape that. Now, over the course of Jeff John's run, and again, we'll get through this kind of stuff, she basically found herself in a relationship with Kyle Rayner. The issue with this is that when the son of Kyle Rayner arrived in the present day, Kyle Rayner realized it was his son, but he didn't realize it until after his son was dead. And so because of this, when he realized that it was basically the child of himself and Saronic, he actually hid that information from her. The other half of this is he's basically trying to convince her to join the Green Lanterns under the idea that he looks to the future and says, okay, our son basically became a villain. And maybe it's because of the fact that Saronic fell back to the Sinestro Corps. Maybe it's because of any number of things, you know, any, any situation that could lead to their, their child becoming a bad guy. And so what he ended up looking to do was basically move her towards the aspect of being a Green Lantern without her really knowing what his true motivations were. So again, there's a couple plots going on with that kind of a thing. Now, in terms of the Green Lanterns realizing the fact that one of their members had killed a member of the Sinestro Corps, this comes by way of one of the Raiders. But where the Green Lanterns say, we're going to lock you up, we're going to throw you in jail, you're going to stand trial for your crimes, his answer is, no, you're not, you're going to let me go because I have video evidence to prove that one of your Green Lanterns killed a Yellow Lantern. Now, in normal circumstances, it wouldn't matter. But remember, with Saronic leading the Sinestro Corps and John Stewart of Earth leading the Green Lantern Corps, they have a truce. And so because of this, when they're faced with this information, there's a little bit of a rift in the Green Lanterns all the way up at the very top, which is to say Hal Jordan, largely considered to be the greatest of the Green Lanterns, the most decorated, and John Stewart, who's currently running the show. The reason behind this is because for Hal Jordan, the question has to be asked, what's going on here? Is any of this true? But at the same time, he doesn't want to believe it. John Stewart is a pragmatic man. If he's given a piece of evidence that may have some validity, then his goal is to seek it out and see whether or not it's absolutely true. So really, he's a lot more logical here, whereas Hal Jordan is thinking more emotionally than anything else. Now, the other half of this is that for Jon Stewart, if this is true, if it's true that a member of the Green Lantern Corps killed a member of the Sinestro Corps, and that is strictly forbidden according to the truce they have, it will bring everything crashing down because one of these Green Lanterns went rogue, which is also an indication that he does not have as much control of the Green Lanterns as he thought he did. And so again, this all gets kind of wild, but ultimately we end up picking up with Saronic traveling to the morgue to see the son of Kyle Rayner. Of course, again, she doesn't really know the fact that it is her son, but going through here and performing all these different studies, because of the fact that she's a doctor, DNA analysis, different things like that. She's basically told, 
This being has two sides to its DNA. One side is human, the father being Kyle Rayner. The other side is Karugian, I guess is how you pronounce it, uh, the child of Saronic Natu. Now, of course, this sends her immediately over the edge because what she's basically being told here is she has fought alongside in a conflict that resulted in her own son being killed. This is massive. Not only that, when Hal Jordan travels to see Tomar II, he basically ends up discovering at the same time that Jon Stewart does that Tomar II was the one who killed this member of the Sinestro Corps. Now, of course, Jon Stewart finds out by virtue of the fact that Guy Gardner, another one of the Green Lanterns, and Arkillo, a member of the Sinestro Corps, both of whom are working together, had basically gone on this mission to essentially grab this spot that was basically observing the entire thing. And they had looked at the video footage and came to the realization that Tomar II had committed this crime. But for Hal Jordan, he's coming across circumstantial evidence. And that's why these things are totally different. Jon Stewart's got video proof. Hal Jordan just comes across Tomar II, who's using his willpower to keep this Sinestro ring confined. Now, this is also kind of an interesting situation because it's not something DC really talks about so much, which is to say, what happens when a Green Lantern goes to sleep? But before we get to that, what we end up doing is we pick up with uh, with Tomar II, again, encountering this member of the Sinestro Corps. And this guy basically says, look, I will never honor a truce between the Green Lanterns and the Sinestro Corps. That's never going to happen. And this guy was basically a serial killer of children, no less. And so there's really no mercy on really any round with regards to this guy. But the issue is the Green Lanterns are designed as a peacekeeping and a police force. They're not designed to be this strong arm of some dictator somewhere. So they can't just take the law into their own hands. They're not judge, jury, and executioner. And so because of this, when Tomar II is basically goaded and this guy essentially says, hey, look, yeah, I'll go to jail and I'll stand trial and I'll go through their little science cells, essentially the, the prison of the Green Lanterns, and I'll break out just like I did before and I'll go back and I'll, I'll kill kids again. Ultimately, Tomar II kills him. Now, in truth, this makes sense. It makes, it makes perfect sense. The purpose of prison is the hope that they can basically find redemption. But some individuals are not looking for redemption. They don't believe that what they do is wrong, or if they do know it's wrong, they don't care. They enjoy doing it. This member of the Sinestro Corps was one of those. And so in a moment of anger and in a moment of wrath, Tomar II kills him, encases his ring, and then basically tells his partner, you saw nothing and you heard nothing. We end up finding out when Tomar II is talking to uh, Hal Jordan, the reason why he's been getting sick is because of the fact that in order to keep this yellow lantern ring encased in this box of willpower, he can never sleep. Now, this is kind of cool because, again, this is basically the idea that when a Green Lantern goes to sleep, they presumably take off the rings, any number of things, and the result is that they are effectively powerless. In this instance, this guy has been using his willpower day and night, 24 hours a day, non-stop, never sleeping, and has pushed his body to the point of physical exhaustion. The problem with this is that, again, in the face of this circumstantial evidence, Hal Jordan doesn't want to believe it's true, and that makes sense because he He's basically being told one of your oldest friends and one of the best members of the Green Lantern Corps killed a member of the Sinestro Corps in cold blood. This member of the Sinestro Corps said, fine, I will go to your science cells. That is a damning piece of evidence because it's basically this guy saying, I give up. It's really the idea, really the goal of Jon Stewart to sweep it under the rug and to keep it all very hush hush. Now, this is huge with regards to Jon Stewart because he's always been a man who had this like moral viewpoint, right? Where he says, okay, there's right, there's wrong. Sure, there's circumstantial evidence, but in the end, we have to abide by the law and the truth. What he's basically doing here is he's trying to play both sides. He's trying to essentially say, okay, look, this member of the Green Lantern Corps committed a crime against the Sinestro Corps. Normally, we would basically have him executed or we would basically kick him out. But if anybody finds out that he killed a member of the Sinestro Corps, everything we built is being destroyed. It's going to come crashing down. And so it's his idea to basically take this guy, throw him in a science cell. He'll never be seen or heard from again, and no one will find out what it was that he did make it go away now of course transitioning back over to the whole scenario with uh with Saranik Natu and with Kyle Rayner she's basically just pissed she is mad as hell because in her mind Kyle Rayner denied her something that she should have had the right to know Kyle Rayner basically knew that this guy who died was their kid she was part of this whole situation and never once was she told this is a huge betrayal of trust on the highest levels Kyle Rayner had basically said come back to the Green Lanterns I want you here I need need you in my life, all the while hiding something of such a high degree. Now, if he had gone to her almost immediately after he found out and said, okay, hey, look, here's everything that I know, maybe Saronic would be understanding, maybe she wouldn't. The issue is that Kyle did not afford her that opportunity. She had to find out the hard way. She had to be blindsided by this fact. And so in her anger,
anger and in her wrath, she completely falls back down to the role of her father, Sinestro. Now, this is crazy, and it's actually pretty interesting that this happens, because Saronic, again, had spent so much time trying to assure people she was not like her father. She spent so much time trying to fight that aspect of herself and prove to herself above all others that she was not Thal Sinestro. All it took was the betrayal from a close friend to make that happen. And that's really the center point of all this. Killing joke example, all it ever takes is one bad day. For Thal Sinestro, it was trying to impose order on a planet, fallen prey to government corruption, to corporate corruption, to people who just stuck their head in the sands hoping the world's problems would go away. It was him trying to restore order to all that and being banished from the Green Lantern Corps for abusing his power. For Saronic, it's her experiencing the trust of someone that she loved, of someone that she trusted more than almost any other. And so it's a very, very big deal because as soon as this happens, and of course, when it comes to, you know, John Stewart making his discussion, not revealing the fact that a member of the Green Lantern Corps had killed a member of the Sinestro Corps, ultimately word gets around. And when it does, all hell breaks loose. The Sinestro Corps come bolting for this guy. And they immediately, like, they, they're out for blood. They want this guy gone. They want him dead. Of course, this leads directly to Hal Jordan, to Jon Stewart, basically drawing lines in the sand and saying, okay, here's the here's where things stand. You know, Guy Gardner shows up with the body of Kyle Rayner, says somebody imprinted a Sinestro core symbol on his chest, not knowing that it's Saronic. And it's them basically saying, hey, look, everybody needs to calm down. Everybody needs to relax. Only for Saronic to show up and say, I'm the one who branded Kyle Rayner. And her anger here, she's speaking out of, out of fear. She's speaking out of the fact that she's emotionally crushed. That's really what this is. And in her mind, experiencing such a huge betrayal from Kyle Rayner extends out into everything else being heartbroken and saying, well, this alliance was never going to work. This alliance was never going to happen. It's somebody just getting frustrated and just tearing the house apart out of anger. She's essentially saying, we were all duped. We were all tricked. We were told that things would be great. We were told that things would be amazing. We were brought here to MoGo. They allowed us to build a central power battery, the source of our power. They allowed us to build it here so that we could all be even, but the truth is that we never were. And we know that because a member of the Sinestro Corps kills a member of the Green Lantern Corps. Well, man, justice needs to be served. Something needs to be done. But a member of the Green Lantern Corps kills a member of the Sinestro Corps. Well, I mean, you know, let's not be too hasty in our rush to judgment. You know, and so because of that, what she's seeing is a contradiction on behalf of the Green Lanterns. Now, heavy is the crown. That's the price Jon Stewart is paying because he's literally trying to hold all this together and none of it's working. And so what he basically does is he says, look, here's how things are going to be. Those of you guys who are faithful, those of you guys who want to remain on the side of good, who believe that good can come out of this alliance, stand on this side of the line. People who don't agree, go join Saronic. Half the Sinestro Corps goes to her side, half the Sinestro Corps stays on the Green Lantern side, and it just erupts into this massive battle. It's essentially just Green Lantern versus Sinestro Corps member versus Sinestro Corps member. It's literally a Sinestro Corps civil war. The problem is that it does not last very long, and the reason why is because what ended up happening is that in the middle of all this, Jon Stewart effectively put this sort of caveat in the central power battery of the Sinestro Corps in the sense that if he basically executes this command, codename Katma, what it essentially does is it shuts down the Sinestro Corps, uh, Corps rings. It overrides them and keeps them from attacking Green Lanterns. This does not help his case. What this does, if anything, is it actually instills a more entrenched belief among the members of the Sinestro Corps that Jon Stewart and the Green Lanterns Lanterns never trusted him. But for Jon Stewart, he's also got a legitimate argument here. Again, when the Sinestro Corps war first picked, off, uh, first picked off, the Sinestro Corps took no prisoners. They came across a Green Lantern, that Green Lantern was dead. Every single time. There were no prisoners taken, no quarter given. And so from Jon Stewart's perspective, it's a legitimate gripe to take. But what ends up happening is Saronic grabs the faithful Sinestro Corps members, takes off into space and says, look, we'll find our own way. We will form a new base of operations. We will find a place that we can call our own and we'll call it a day. That'll basically be it. Now, the reason why this is also a really big moment too is because we're Jon Stewart and everybody's like, okay, look, everything's kind of quelled. We have the faithful here on our side. We don't know when they'll come back, but it'll be somewhere else later on down the line. For right now, the conflict is done. What we end up doing is picking up on the planet Cord in the antimatter universe. And what we end up finding out is that Thal Sinestro is not dead. He's very much alive. He's actually just been resurrected. And so all we have to do is just wait until his body physically returns back to his normal state. And when it does, the question becomes, what happens to the Sinestro Core after that? 
So while this technically takes place before the events of Dark Knight's Metal in terms of chronology, I consider it to be a tie-in. And the reason why is because this deals with the whole idea of Nth Metal in terms of what it's capable, what it can do, and why it's so powerful in the realm of DC Comics. Remember, when it came to Dark Knight's Metal, that basically amplified or really sort of expanded on the nature of Nth Metal. Prior to Dark Knight's Metal, Nth Metal was just this, this material that existed out there, but there wasn't really anything special about it. It had magical properties, and that was really about it. What Dark Knight's Metal does is it basically says that Nth Metal is permeated throughout the entirety of the DC multiverse, but it all originates from the Dark Multiverse. And so it's cool, because what this also does is it sees the return of one of the most powerful villains that existed out there in the realm of DC Comics. Now, initially, we basically just pick up with these beings that look very similar to Celestials from Marvel Comics in terms of their physical form. In the middle of all this, while the Green Lanterns are sort of wrestling with the fallout of the whole fractured story arc, which basically saw the alliance between the Green Lanterns and the Sinestro Corps coming to an end. Some members of the Sinestro Corps staying with the Green Lanterns, but a good portion of them basically leaving and taking off into space. What this means is the Green Lanterns numbers are basically down to almost zero again. Keep in mind that when most of the Green Lanterns were kind of shunted off to the beginning of all things, to the beginning of time more or less in the universe, what it did is it allowed the Sinestro Corps to sort of rise to prominence as a police force. But where Thal Sinestro himself was eventually defeated and believed to have been killed, the result is that his daughter Saronic took over the Sinestro Corps as a former Green Lantern. Now where her father was very villainous in terms of how he ran the whole Sinestro Corps, she ran it as more of a superhero kind of team. And forming an alliance with the Green Lanterns, when that ended, it was all predicated on the idea that the, the child of Kyle Rayner, the Green Lantern, and Saronic Natu came from the future, that child was killed, and then Kyle Rayner didn't tell Saronic what happened. And the result is that she lost all trust in the Green Lanterns, sort of became a villain, to, you know, declared herself the new Sinestro, and took off into space. You know, we covered that with the whole, uh, the whole fractured storyline. But the long and short of this is that the Green Lantern's numbers are still very, very thin. And so it's really left to Jon Stewart as the leader of the Green Lantern Corps to try to hold it all together. And so he's really doing double duty in a lot of different ways. On one side, he's going through and he's trying to make sure that what's left of the Green Lanterns still maintain themselves as a cohesive team, which by and large, they're doing for the most part. The other half of this is that the universe still needs to be protected. There's still villains out there. There's still things that the Green Lanterns have to do, and they're trying to maintain that role. But in the midst of this huge, you know, spark of energy that's more or less picked up by Jon Stewart, of course, he sends uh, Kyle Rayner and he sends uh, Hal Jordan to investigate. The problem is when they get there, what they end up finding is an entire star system has been totally obliterated. When this happens, of course, what we end up having are boom tubes that are opening. What immediately follows is not just the character of Orion, but Omega Beams. And Omega Beams are usually a direct indication of the presence of Darkseid. Now, one of the things that I want to talk about here is the character of Orion, because we've talked about him before. Before a lot of people who were jumping into DC Rebirth, Orion is a foreign concept to them. They don't really know anything about him. So, when it comes to the new gods, you've basically got Apocalypse with Darkseid, and you've got New Genesis with High Father. In the New 52, they're basically brothers, but the whole idea here is that they represent the very nature of the opposing dichotomies of good and evil. That's really what they are. Apocalypse is evil, New Genesis is good. Now, in a lot of ways, their motivations can be called into question. There are times where, you know, the, the good guys, New Genesis guys, have done some pretty questionable things. But overall, despite what they might do in the short term, in the long term, they're good guys, they're heroes, and they function that way. Now, with the whole idea of these two opposing forces, inevitably, they went to war with one another, and they warred for, like, eons and eons and eons. In order to basically construct a truce, what ended up happening is one of the beings that was part of the whole New Gods mythos called Metron had basically brokered a truce between the two worlds. What they would do is they would exchange their sons. And so what ended up happening is Orion, the son of Darkseid, was sent to live with Highfather, whereas the son of Highfather, Scott Free, was sent to live with Darkseid. That's the reason why Scott Free, Mr. Miracle, is kind of like a master of escape artist because the locks were so strong and so durable on Apocalypse that him being able to basically break out of those made him capable of breaking through some of the, the best, you know, devices that exist out there in terms of locks and codes and different things like that. But Orion, being a member of the New Gods, has always been more or less the Prince of New Genesis, which is to say the adopted son, more or less, of Highfather. And the role he plays has always been the sort of on-again, off-again hero that's worked alongside the various superheroes. Now, the reason why I say on-again, off-again is just because of the fact that, remember, for years and years and years, the New Gods are basically isolated to their own line of comics. So you didn't see them cross over all the time, but it was usually always Orion who was like the liaison when it came to the new gods working alongside superheroes. But there's history here is really kind of the overall point that Robert Venditti is making here. It's not like the new gods are meeting the Green Lanterns for the very first time. Not only that, the last time these two groups met, Kyle Rayner was the White Lantern. He was the most powerful of all the lanterns who were out there. The funny thing about this though, is that when Orion shows up, he's like, look, you know, there's something hunting us in New Genesis, trying to kill off 
off all the new gods. Uh, we need your all's help. And we really, really need the White Lantern. Like, if you guys know, if, if the White Lantern's here, get him because, like, we could really use his help. We really need the White Lantern. <laughs> and it's funny because Kyle Rayner used to be the White Lantern and he's not anymore. So it's kind of interesting. And of course, this basically falls on the shoulders of just the Green Lanterns to cope with on their own. But keep in mind, when it comes to the new gods, they are in a lot of ways almost immutable and indestructible. I mean, they can be killed, but it takes beings of immense power in order to pull it off. And so when the new gods show up and they're like, we need, we, you know, we basically need help. It means times are that dire because under normal circumstances, Green Lanterns should not be able to take on and defeat beings that are capable of overpowering new gods. The problem is that things are just that bad. Now, of course, with these Omega Beams basically hitting Orion, these Omega Beams function in the exact same capacity that we're used to. Once they're sicked on a target, they find that target and they keep chasing after them until they hit them or until that target goes to a place that the Omega Beams can't follow. On the surface, this looks like Darkseid. It looks like Darkseid has somehow reappeared, Darkseid's back and waging a war against the new gods. The problem with this is that once they basically get, you know, Orion onto a stretcher when they get him back, uh, what ends up happening is he's, his heart is more or less shut down. When his heart is restarted, when he's brought back, he immediately panics because he's like, all hope is lost here. This planet is going to be obliterated because the Omega Beams are going to continue following him until they're dead. And again, the reason for this is because Orion is basically being chased by a giant machine of sorts, basically one of these Celestials that sent these Omega Beams beams after him and that once it believed that he was dead when his heart stopped it backed off but when he was brought back it immediately started chasing after him again so this thing appears to have been designed for the purpose of just tracking down and killing new gods everywhere it can find them but notice this this thing is wildly powerful i mean it's huge it's monstrous in size it's very much like a celestial from marvel comics and it's really intriguing where well, the green lanterns face off against it as best they can evacuating people out where they can what we end up having is the head of the medical staff that was able to save uh save orion has effectively created a, a fake heart of sorts. It's really this idea that this heart can be used to basically continue circulating blood throughout the body of Orion while his physical heart is stopped. And so what ends up happening here is once they pull this off, once Kyle Rayner creates this construct and is basically able to use it to artificially continue pumping blood throughout the body of Orion, because his physical his physical heart is believed to have stopped, this thing immediately backs off and it moves on to its next target. So again, constantly going after all these different new gods, tracking these guys down, taking these guys out. This is a pretty over overwhelming force. Now, following this, once we get him back to the Green Lantern base of operations, that's when the information begins to come in. Remember, when it comes to Robert Venditti's, you know, writing style, at least from what I've been able to see, a lot of it's kind of an introductory thing. You know, things going crazy, things going nuts, and then we start to get into the ex uh, explanation. It's designed to grab us and reel us in. These massive machines are basically being referred to as golems, but the reason why I consider this to be a Dark Knight's Metal tie-in is because what it does is it picks up on two things. The first is the nature of nth metal in terms of the fact that it's one of the most powerful concepts that exists out there, but the second is also the character of Yuga Khan. Now, Yuga Khan, as most people probably don't know, is the father of Darkseid, but the way his history is done here is a little bit intriguing. When it came to the New 52 and the origin of Darkseid himself, Yuga Khan didn't really exist. He wasn't really there. Darkseid, as Yuxas, you know, basically led a rebellion against the old gods, took them all out, and then him and High Father went to war against each other, and that was the end of that. Yuga Khan is largely a pre-New 52 character, meaning a character who largely had a, a bulk of his appearances before 2011. Now, even before then, he goes all the way back to the 1970s. But you're talking about a guy who's appeared in DC Comics less than like 150 times. He hasn't shown up all that often. But the mega nations and the schemes of Yuga Khan are for the most part always the same. He was the original god among all gods, the most powerful of all gods in existence. He ran Apocalypse with an iron fist. He was hardcore, he was ruthless, and he was cutthroat. But he desired to attain absolute power and tried to enter the source, basically the source of all energy of all beings that exist in the DC universe. The result is that once he tried to pass through the source wall, like all other beings who have tried to enter the source, he was locked inside the wall and he was presumably stuck there for all eternity. What this does is it expands on that initial origin and it basically says that what Yuka Khan also had was basically an army of sorts that was composed almost entirely of nth metal. And the reason why this matters is because no one believed this army was real. A lot of that was because when it came to Yuka Khan, because him being locked in the source while it happened so long before the events of a lot of the modern day stories had taken place, the result is that he was largely believed to have just been a myth. But with the idea that Yuga Khan had basically been locked away in a source wall and was essentially trying to engineer his own escape, these machines effectively reactivated. This army came to fruition again with two main purposes. The first was to follow the campaign, follow the programming instituted by Yuga Khan to eliminate all individuals who could possibly take over as the ruler of Apocalypse and 
Yuga's absence, effectively eliminating heirs. The second of this was to bring Yuga Khan back. Now remember, right now when it comes to DC Rebirth, Darkseid is not Darkseid anymore. He's not there anymore. He's basically just a baby. He doesn't really pose a challenge. In terms of people who are capable of being able to take over the throne of Apocalypse in the absence of Yuga Khan, then it means Orion is the most logical person to do it because Orion is the biological son of Darkseid. So a lot of history that's thrown in, a lot of the backlog of stories that have taken place. But following this, what they end up doing is they basically say, okay, we have to search his mind even further because we have to find out where High Father is. High Father being the leader of all the new gods in New Genesis is largely believed to be one of the more powerful of the new gods, right up there with the power of Darkseid. And so if the Green Lanterns are struggling against these golems, then of course High Father is perceived to be their best measure of being able to take these guys out. Simultaneously, if they are hunting new gods, then it stands to reason they're hunting High Father. And so because of this, once they track down where it is that High Father may be at, the only thing they're able to gain is the name of a person called Light Ray. Now, Light Ray is like the New Gods version of the Flash, and his character is actually pretty intriguing. He made his first appearance in New Gods number one back in 1971, but like a lot of the other New Gods, he was given a pretty cool origin in the sense that him and Orion were extremely close friends. The issue here is that somewhere along the line, Light Ray and Orion had basically discovered like an apocalyptic outpost or something like that that was on New Genesis, and the result was that following a battle, Light Ray was hit with like a whole bunch of solar radiation, he fell into a coma for a while, and when he popped back up, he had all these solar powers. He could basically manipulate light itself in a multitude of different ways. Now, one of the things that he did is he actually ended up pushing himself and kind of becoming the fastest of all the new gods. So, in a lot of ways, Light Ray was like Marvel's Makari. That was an Eternal who basically devoted all of his power to pushing his speed to the absolute limits. With Light Ray, it's much the same way. But because of this, with Light Ray being the fastest of all the new gods, he's basically able to traverse all through space and time uh, using, you know, his power of flight. But with Hal Jordan basically tasked with trying to track down Light Ray and ultimately locate whether or not he actually has High Father with him, the biggest hindrance he has is his constructs do not seem to be able to move as fast as Light Ray is able to travel. Now, of course, this is actually a pretty amazing moment here because while he's trying to pilot the ship, he basically ends up backing the whole thing down. He really just kind of slows down and it seems like all hope is lost when he's basically met with an image of his father. Now, we're not told how he got here. It's basically this whole idea that his dad appears and offers these words of encouragement to Hal Jordan. I have faith in you, I believe in you, but it's a very touching moment because one of the things that's really always emphasized when it comes to the character of Hal is his father always played an exceedingly large role in his life, albeit the fact that his father had died when he was younger. The result of this is that every time Hal Jordan flies, whenever it is that he goes on some mission or something like that, he needs to kind of pep himself up, prepare for what it is that's going to happen. His question is, what would my dad do? What would my father do in this situation? And again, it's a really beautiful and touching aspect of his character because because of course, where the question's asked, am I hallucinating you? You know, what in the world is going on here? Instead of his father sort of being just this kind of general image, he speaks and moves as if you were actually there in real life. And he even goes as far as to say, I don't really know if you're hallucinating me or not. You're basically in the wake of a cosmic god that's flying at the speed of light. It's very ambiguous. It's very cloak and dagger, but it's not designed to answer the question, is his father really here? It's designed to emphasize the nature and the relationship between Hal Jordan and his dad and how big of a role his father plays. And so again, because of the fact that his dad was courageous, because of the fact that his dad did whatever it took in order to achieve the goal, Hal Jordan follows the exact same path. And where he begins flying his ship, pulling up on the speed of light, what we also end up having is this warning coming from his construct that Hal Jordan is approaching a speed force singularity. What this means is that if he kept traveling faster, he would have entered the speed force most, uh, most likely. Hal Jordan may have gained the powers of the Flash. It's cool. With him basically running into High Father, running into Light Ray, he basically says, look, I can take over from here if you guys need me to, I can help out. And it makes sense because High Father's response is despite the powers of Light Ray, while he is a new god, his energy is not infinite. Eventually he'll tire out. And with those Omega Beams chasing them down, as he begins to slow, the beams do not slow down. With Hal Jordan grabbing High Father, bringing him on board, and basically taking off between the two of them, it's interesting because these Omega Beams are still following them. And in fact, Hal Jordan actually comes up with this pretty ingenious plan where the construct of Kyle Rayner is being used continually to basically maintain the construct that's serving as the heart of Orion, he's not really able to leave and not really able to go anywhere. Instead, what we end up finding out is that because of the fact that these Omega Beams are chasing after the new gods, or at least, you know, only those who are present in this immediate vicinity, chasing after High Father, and because of the fact Orion is believed to have been dead, these golems move on to their second process, which is trying to free Yuga Khan from the source wall. Now, keep in mind, if Yuga Khan is freed, if this happens, then all hope is lost. Basically, everybody's gonna die. The other question that has to be asked here is, how does this this coincide
side with the dark side war Shazam one shot. For those of you guys who don't know, Billy Batson, also known as Shazam, really Captain Marvel back in the 1930s, derived his powers from a handful of different gods, you know, all of whom basically spelled out the acronym Shazam. The issue is that during the original Dark Side War storyline, at the tail end of the New 52, Shazam got his powers from a new set of gods, one of which was Yuga Khan. The last we saw him, he was just kind of preparing to institute his campaign. So we don't really know how to bridge this gap between the last time we saw Yuga Khan and how he ended up in the Source Wall. I don't really believe there's a continuity error, just because DC Rebirth plays continuity pretty close to the vest. It may be that that kind of thing gets fleshed out later on down the line, most likely when it comes to the return of Shazam himself, whether it's in a solo series or what have you, or if Yuga Khan manages to be freed from the Source Wall and then gives us this whole great big huge exposition on what it was that happened with this character and how he got to where he is, you know, and DC gives us a whole backstory. But it's cool because remember, if Yuga Khan gets out, everybody dies. And so that's the first instance of the, of the Green Lanterns is to fight this war on two fronts. The first part is to stop all these different golems. And the second is to keep them away from Yuga Khan. So it's a pretty desperate scenario. Now, of course, with regards to Hal Jordan and Highfather essentially racing back with the Omega Beams following them, they basically play chicken. And it's a pretty genius maneuver here in the sense that Hal Jordan effectively dives out of the way just before the moment of impact and the Omega Beams hit one of the golems and completely incinerate them. Following that, it's a matter of trying to take out as many other of these beings as they can. Once they learn the weakness is basically the, the point in their chest, then it becomes a matter of just creating as many constructs as they can, as large as they can, and just hammering it away at it all until they can finally take these guys out. With all these different golems having been defeated, the final one appears. And so, of course, Highfather kind of jumps into the fray, and Highfather is able to crack the armor just enough for Jon Stewart to fire off a killing shot and to destroy this thing. But keep in mind, Highfather, while he is powerful, is not all powerful. He can be destroyed. But the fact that these things were designed for the purpose of destroying new gods meant that they had to have been designed for the purpose of destroying new gods of all power like Highfather. Otherwise, there'd be no purpose in creating that army. And so as a result, with the final golem having been destroyed, basically having been taken out, that impetus basically falls on Highfather to sort of, you know, taunt Yuga Khan a little bit, say, hey, there's no chance of you getting out, and really sort of calling it a day. And so the story basically wraps up this quick little involvement with the new gods and the Green Lanterns themselves sort of teaming up. Things kind of wrap up with Orion having his heart put back into his chest, everybody saying, peace, you know, thanks for helping out, and they go their own separate ways. Things wrap up pretty fast. It's not really one of these stories that was designed to set the stage for everything else that goes on and all these expansive things things and all that kind of good stuff. Again, it's just one of these stories. It's designed to remind us characters like Yuga Khan still exist. There are some pretty formidable threats out there. The source wall, all those things are still out there. So it is pretty cool. And it certainly is interesting in terms of what may come after this. Okay, so continuing our discussions on uh, DC Rebirth, we pick up now with Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps. And in fact, what we're going to do when we get around to the end of this video is we're going to kind of round out this discussion on DC Rebirth just because of the fact that the end of the story will actually see, and even the story itself, will see kind of a return to familiarity with regards to characters that we haven't seen for quite some time. And again, sort of set the stage for what DC Rebirth really is. Or not really set the stage, but kind of explain what DC Rebirth, you know, is, is really all about. But initially, we pick up here with the Templar Guardians. Now, the Templar Guardians are kind of interesting because as far as I'm aware, they just vanished one day. Like they vanished really when it came to the character of Relic. In order to keep from spoiling things too much, because we'll talk about the Templar Guardians as we go through our Green Lantern videos on Sunday, the Templar Guardians are basically a subsect of the Guardians of the Universe that are guarding an exceedingly powerful being, like a being that's literally going to lay waste to the entirety of all the Lantern Corps. It's gonna, it's gonna be a bloodbath, <laughs> but it's one of the best stories ever. But uh, the other half of this is that the Templar Guardians, as far as I'm aware basically like vanished during the whole thing with Relic. And what I mean by that is eventually the Templar Guardians basically stepped away from their role or really there was no need for them to maintain their role anymore and they kind of took up the position of the other Guardians of the Universe and the result is that instead of being removed from the Universal landscape which is to say kind of keeping themselves hidden off and really being obsessed with the fact that they were right all the time, the Templar Guardians wanted to have more of a hand in things. Now this led into the introduction of Relic, basically a character who was from a previous universe I think it was and it was the idea that his universe had basically basically been overrun and destroyed by people who were uh, harvesting and using the emotional spectrum, and he wanted to keep that from happening in the DC universe as it existed now. And so his goal was to basically destroy all the lanterns. But the fact remains here, it is pretty cool because the Templar Guardians after that, uh, again, as far as I'm aware, they, they were just gone. All we got was just Ganthet and Sade in DC Comics, and that's it. It is interesting, and it is kind of intriguing because it does really see them come back here. So it may very well be that this, you know, this back end gets explained, assuming that, you know, I'm not missing something. But at this point, we actually transition over to a 
newly introduced uh, Green Lantern, which is actually a kid. And it's cool because when it comes to the Green Lanterns, more often than not, when we see Green Lanterns, we see them usually as like young adults or adults. And so they've kind of reached that point in their life where they're like, okay, so like it's time to get down to business. But for a kid, they respond exactly the way that we would. Like if we were given a Green Lantern ring, like we're just going to fly around and have like the most fun ever. And that's exactly what happens. You know, this kid experiencing, you know, experiences all the joy. And that's the benefit of this is that it's kind of a fresh influx of innocence into a Green Lantern core that's been through so much. Because remember, the Green Lanterns during the whole, you know, Lost Army and Edge of Oblivion story, they were basically pushed almost to the brink of extinction. I mean, their numbers dwindled down to what amounts to a handful relative to how big their numbers used to be before. Where they were in the thousands, now they're down to, you know, a few dozen, maybe a hundred. And so the result is that they're they're really doing the best they can to kind of keep everything intact. What Vin Diddy does here is he very much writes this in a way where it's like children of men, for example. You know, humanity's on the brink of destruction, you know, and no one's having kids anymore. And then suddenly a woman gives birth to a kid. And it's like that iconic scene from that movie when, you know, the rebels are fighting against the British soldiers. And then, you know, this baby starts crying and the whole conflict stops. Everyone stops until this baby leaves. And then the conflict kicks back in again. That's really what this is designed to be. It's innocence. It's, you know, John Stewart as the leader of the Green Lanterns. I almost forgot what it's like to see a child enjoy life in such a capacity because remember, they're out in space. So they're largely removed from all that stuff. It is cool here because this is one of those things where Ganthic kind of hints at the idea of, hey, Sade, you ever thought about having a kid? But of course, her her response is, well, I mean, I, I assume you're talking about like lowering the restriction. I assume you're not talking about having a child because we're kind of old and I don't know if I could survive it. <laughs> but the fact remains here. The cool thing about Venditti's writing is that it's very reminiscent of classic Green Lantern stories in the sense that the whole thing would kick up and then here's what the Green Lanterns are doing while it's going on. Now, a lot of that's because of the fact that when Jeff Johns took up the Green Lantern uh, line of comics, it was just one series of events after another. It's just event after event after event after event. Sinestro Core War, Blackest Night, Brightest Day, all these things, just one event after another. And so there really wasn't a whole lot of time to kind of show the downtime of Lanterns. I mean, there was to a degree, but it wasn't a huge focal point. It was building up the mythos and expanding all these cores and all that kind of cool stuff. And so it's almost like Venditti's run, at least right now in DC Rebirth, is more like us catching our breath, kind of sitting down and saying, okay, now let's see what the Green Lanterns are about. And it's cool because we get this moment, you know, between Hal Jordan and, and Kyle Rayner, you know, where they're talking about, you know, they're, they're putting things back together and they're helping a civilization survive, you know, the, the eruption of a volcano and different things like that. Problem with this is that in the middle of Ganthet and Sade, you know, talking to this new Green Lantern and, you know, basically informing them of the role they play and the importance of the power they possess, they're suddenly met by the arrival of enemies that we don't see. And so, of course, Ganthet tells this young girl, run, you know, go get Kilowog, go tell somebody, make people aware of what's going on. And then, of course, Ganthet and Sade are basically, you know, kidnapped and taken away. Now, from here, this little kid races off to the Green Lanterns and is like, hey guys, uh, so like Ganthan and Sade have been kidnapped and, and things are going crazy and we need your help. <laughs> And it's kind of funny. And so the result is that what we end up finding out here is that they've been taken by the controllers. Now, the controllers, as they exist in DC Comics, really exist in a couple different forms, as you would expect with characters who have been around long enough. There's the pre-crisis version, then there's the post-crisis version. The pre-crisis version appeared back in like 1967, I think it was. And they were basically characters uh, who were just from like a different universe. And that was really it. I mean, it was just one of these old Jim Shooter style stories from way back in the day where it was like, well, I mean, you know, they came from a different universe and, you know, something like that. And they were trying to keep this universe from being destroyed or something along those lines. The controllers as we know them, uh, really, it's their post-crisis origin. And the post-crisis origin for the uh, for the controllers themselves, what we end up finding out is that where originally you had the Maltusians who basically evolved to become the guardians of the universe, what we ended up having was that some of them actually defected. Some of them went away. And basically, the males broke off and went to do their own thing, and they became the controllers. They kind of hyper-accelerated their own evolution and manipulated their own structures, different things like that, leading up to their current state. Now, the females left, and they became the Zamorons. They became the Star Sapphires. Uh, but the result is that those individuals who stayed became the Guardians of the Universe. And so that's kind of how those two groups progressed. But it is cool because the controllers were always kind of hell-bent on doing exactly what they sound like, controlling things. And so largely the controllers were enemies of the Guardians and the Green Lanterns. And that was really about it. Now, of course, the controllers also really made their, uh, at least one of their big moments in modern history when it came to uh, really the introduction of Larflees as the Orange Lantern. Now, some of the controllers had shown up trying to capture the power of the Orange Lantern, and they were basically killed 
by Larflees, and that was really about it. But again, the controllers, as you've seen them in the more recent stories of Green Lanterns, you know, leading up to DC Rebirth and leading up to New 52, that's about the max that you got. I mean, they're really reminiscent of an older age of Green Lantern comics that people don't really read about anymore. And so it is kind of intriguing, but the basis behind them kidnapping the Guardians is that while they are their own subsect of a race now, they do all stem from the same thing. And so genetically, they are pretty much identical. They all stem from the same genetic pool. And so the logic of the controllers is to basically find a way to essentially strip the Guardians of their genetic material, harvest them more or less, and then repopulate the controllers. Because remember, much like the Guardians, it doesn't really seem like the controllers are able to procreate using traditional means. And even if they could, they're all dudes. So I don't really know how you'd be able to pull that off. But the fact remains here, it is kind of cool because in response to this, of course, the young, the, the new Green Lantern, the little kid Green Lantern is asked by Jon Stewart, what do they look like? The people that took, you know, the, the Guardians. And the result is that they end up just kind of showing what their physical appearance was, which of course leads to the controllers themselves. And so of course, you know, following this, you basically have this kind of all hands on deck, everybody jumping in, trying to figure out what's going on, so on and so forth. And it does make sense. I mean, it, it really kind of works in the sense that all the Guardians are just kind of responding as we would expect. But with Jon Stewart and Guy Gardner and Hal Jordan and Kyle Rayner, it is kind of personal for them because Ganthan and Sade really sort of represent this idea that the Guardians of the Universe themselves are taking a more traditional role, more of a hands-on role in the universe as opposed to being shut off from it. Not only that, the fact that Jon Stewart returned with all the Green Lanterns and then Ganthan and Sade kind of backed off and allowed him to continue running the Green Lantern Corps on its own does allow for a measure of trust between the two groups because one of the things you guys will notice over the course of our, you know, Sunday Green Lantern run is that for the most part, a lot of distrust is being sowed between the Guardians of the Universe and the Green Lanterns in the sense that the Green Lanterns are slowly beginning to realize the Guardians of the Universe house many secrets and they don't really tell a lot of the Green Lanterns what are going on if they even tell them at all. It's one of those things of, well, you will learn what you need to know when you need to know it and uh, that may or may not come. Now, the other half of this is, you know, once we jump back in and the, and the Templar Guardians or at least some of the Templar Guardians are being harvested, this is a way for Venditti and them to basically begin winding down the number of Guardians to basically say, we're going to start decreasing their numbers slowly but steadily. And it does make sense, you know, in the sense that this is kind of their overarching or at least his overarching goal, assuming that's the case. Because remember, Ganthan and Sade being the only, uh, only Guardians has actually been a pretty popular theme in the Green Lantern landscape for quite some time, just because of the fact that the Guardians have always been a focal point of the Green Lantern stories. And in a lot of ways, it's one of those things where all the stories that can be told have been told. And so if that's the case, then where do you go from there? Will you simply change things up? You switch things around, you move the pieces across on the board and you switch players out and you really just kind of try your hand at making things starkly different than they used to be. And it actually works. Now, the other half of this is that again, I would surmise that with a lot of these Templar guardians basically being eliminated, you know, essentially being removed, you know, the reason for why it was that they effectively vanished was because it allowed Robert Venditti and these guys, really Sam Humphreys as well, to begin introducing characters like Rami to basically say, well, I mean, here's the new origin of the Green Lantern rings and all those kinds of things. And it does make sense, you know, in terms of that. Again, because of the fact that these Templar guardians are kind of just being eliminated, I don't really see us getting a whole lot of exposition in terms of what the Templar guardians are about, where they're from. I imagine DC just kind of relying and saying, if you know who they are, cool. If you don't, don't worry about it. You know, we just kind of end up having to roll with the punches. Now, of course, with the Green Lanterns basically figuring out where the controllers are operating from, their arrivals basically met with a handful of mercenaries. And again, that's why I say this is reminiscent of old school Green Lantern storytelling, because this is what you would see in like the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Man, like some events taking place, well, the Green Lanterns are going to have to respond, but then he runs into an unexpected enemy. Can he overcome them? Yes, he can. Now on to the main foe. That's basically how those stories were told, because DC Rebirth is designed to wrap back around to the old school standard of comic book storytelling. More adventure, more fun, as opposed to like super serious, grounded, realistic, tangible stories. Because at the end of the day, comic books are designed to be an escape, or at least a lot of people view them as, as, a, as an escape. And so that's really what this becomes. I mean, for, for the love of God, you've got John Stewart, a Green Lantern, creating a bazooka out of his ring <laughs> and firing rockets out of it. I mean, if that doesn't scream spacefaring escapades and zonker storytelling, I don't know what does. <laughs> I have no idea what does. Now, of course, the, the Green Lanterns are able to overcome these foes quite readily. But the cool thing about this is, remember, it's kind of a return to what makes the Green Lantern storytelling so well. It's very much forming this kind of camaraderie. And that was something that, in a lot of ways, had kind of been missing from the Green Lantern stories for a little while. In a lot of ways, the characters kind of fell rank and file. But the idea of them kind of coming together and saying, okay, so like the four of us, like the four horsemen of the, of the Green Lantern landscape, we're the only ones who can really pull this off, it works. And it's really kind of a good feeling because it, it brings you back 
back to these old Green Lantern stories back in the day. Now, of course, the funny thing about this too is the controllers weren't really betting on the Green Lanterns. I mean, they, they kind of say they were, but they were really expecting this idea that the Green Lanterns would just kind of wait for a sign from the Guardians or something along those lines. Of course, the Green Lanterns respond and basically just kind of start ripping things up. But remember, it's not designed to be this thing where it's like, the Green Lanterns are here and the day is saved. Everybody's going to lose now. It takes this familiarity of old school storytelling and it blends it in with the modern day Green Lantern stories that we're used to. And that in and of itself is the quintessential definition of DC Rebirth. Grab the old school style of storytelling, combine it with the modern day characters that you're used to, merge them together, and then just see what happens. And it is cool because ultimately what ends up happening is you end up having this scenario where, <laughs> where John Stewart, who creates these uh, reflection discs, and then Hal Jordan fires off a beam, which in turn hits the machine holding the Guardians of the Universe uh, captive, which allows Ganthet and Sade and the other members to basically arise and step in. Now, again, you will notice characters like Rami here. We're not really given a whole lot here just because of the fact that, remember, the Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern line of stories and the Green Lanterns by Sam Humphreys, those are designed to be two distinctly different lines of stories. And so, you know, Rami's basically been fleshed out. Of course, we know he's the guy that created the Phantom Ring, basically a lantern ring that anybody can wield that taps into the entirety of the emotional spectrum. But it does kind of fit in in the sense that if you're following Green Lanterns, one feeds the other. You follow Green Lanterns and then you jump into Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps and you know who Rami is. You're like, I know who that guy is, you know? I'm figuring it out just like everybody else is. Or you're reading Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps and you're like, who's that crazy looking guardian? And then you go and you read Green Lantern's Rebirth and you're like, Okay, so that's like one of the older Guardians. That's that's really cool. Now, ultimately, of course, with the defeat of the controllers, they end up making their escape. And it's kind of funny because one of the Guardians actually wants to kill him. You know, Zala wants to kill off the controllers, which is actually the most logical stance to take. Ganthit really kind of being in a position where he's like, the new role that we play is more of being Guardians as opposed to being like authoritative figures for the universe. We can't let this happen. Like, we can't just kill them. They have to stand trial, assuming that we can catch them again. And so that's the result because what Venditti does is he basically says, the controllers controllers are back now. The controllers are going to return to becoming enemies of the Green Lanterns. Now, again, this is just kind of grabbing an, an, an older enemy and rolling them in to DC Comics. And so following this, what we end up finding out in this epilogue of sorts is that one, the Guardians of the Universe go back to their original outfits, which is to say basically the red, the white, and the Green Lantern uniform. Not only that, the Templar Guardians have kind of stepped out of their role of just kind of exploring the universe and are now back to being the Guardians of the Universe. And so it's basically Venditti saying, okay, so the Guardians of the Universe are back, different people are playing roles that were occupied by former Guardians who are now gone, but they're going to go back to being the classic Guardians of the Universe. And it works. Again, this is what DC Rebirth is. It's a return to familiarity. It's grabbing all the old things that you remember when you were a kid, when you were 7, 8, 9, 10 years old, and you were reading these comics. It's designed to grab those things and bring them all back in. And so it's cool. And, and, and it really, really works. Not only that, we end up finding out that the controllers are basically bringing back an older enemy. Again, Michael, uh, Michael Jan Friedrich introduced these guys back in 1992. They're bringing back the Dark Stars. The Dark Stars are cool. The Dark Stars are really, really cool. They are basically kind of like this, this merging of the Manhunters and the Green Lanterns kind of combined into one. It was really the attempt of the controllers to create their own version of the Green Lanterns, their own police force, and then just sort of go forward from there. Okay, so continuing on with our whole DC Rebirth thing and Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps, this one is actually pretty interesting. This mind game story is actually kind of cool because what you guys will find, for those of you guys who are new to comic books, what you're going to find is that in a lot of ways, stories are usually designed to kind of wrap up loose ends, especially when you're going into tie-ins or when you're going into like a major event or something along those lines. Now, for the most part, DC is very different from Marvel and Marvel does huge line-wide crossover events seemingly all the time, which is one of the reasons why people developed event fatigue. DC really plays it more close to the vest in the sense that you usually have character-based story arcs. But it's one of these funny scenarios because it's kind of like, you know, all this has happened before and all of it will happen again to quote Battlestar Galactica. It is kind of cool because what this actually does is it invokes Hector Hammond, but it also comes after the Superman story that dealt with Superman getting possessed by Parallax. Now, again, that was kind of cool because it was one of these scenarios where it sort of dealt with the ongoing events as a whole in DC Rebirth. And that's one of the reasons why Rebirth is so important here is because when it came to like the new 52, which is when DC rebooted in 2011, they said, look, we want you to act like we've never printed stories for the very first, you know, we've never printed them before. You've never seen Superman, Batman or anything. We want you to treat them like they're brand new. The funny thing about that was that some of the stories crossed over, but by and large, a lot of the titles were largely isolated. They were basically kind of like doing their own thing. You'd see other references, but with DC Rebirth, what it's really designed to do is effectively say, yes, they are in a shared universe. Yes, some of these events are happening at the same time, but what happens in one comic will 
cross over into another either directly or indirectly you don't see it all the time but it does create some really really good consistency when it comes to continuity and that's one of the really important things because DC had a branding initiative called DCU and it was basically creativity over continuity it was where DC editorial basically went to the writers and said write whatever you want don't worry about the continuity of what goes on in other stories and you started seeing weird things where you had like Batman who was the god of you know god of knowledge when it came to the Justice League title but in his own title Bruce Wayne wasn't Batman it was Commissioner Gordon and so he kind of ran into all these different you know continuity errors different things like that but the cool thing was that with regards to DC Rebirth and the Superman story you dealt with the return of Parallax this living embodiment of fear more or less and the idea of Parallax showing up was really just kind of DC reminding us hey Parallax is here Parallax is still very much part of the landscape but we also saw that Sinestro had kind of made his return for the purpose of tracking down the Parallax entity and trying to take it for himself kind of trying to re you know regain its abilities and go back to his status quo this follows after that and basically saying that after the whole fiasco of the return of Parallax because most all of Earth superheroes are familiar with who Parallax is the Green Lantern Corps is notified now remember you know one of the things that's pointed out here and it's, it's these really small things that I really kind of enjoy about DC Rebirth especially when it comes to Venditti's writing it is really one of these things where Cyborg contacts the, uh, the the Green Lantern Corps and says anything outside of Earth's solar system is your call and because of the fact that Parallax as a as the fear entity is really kind of like part and parcel to the Green Lantern landscape it's effectively handed over to them and so the result is that John Stewart who's basically head of the Green Lantern Corps dispatches one of their number back to Earth now it's kind of funny because Earth has like six Green Lanterns basically John Stewart who's of Earth you've got Kyle Rayner who's of Earth Hal Jordan as well as Jessica Cruz and Simon Bass so you've got like six Green Lanterns that all hail from Earth which is not something you normally see it's one of the cool aspects of the publication history of the Green Lantern mythos but of course Hal Jordan being the star of the Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern core comic is the one that's sent to Earth the fact remains you know with Hal Jordan showing up of course he basically meets with Superman and Superman essentially explains everything that had happened in the Superman story and again that's why this is so cool and that's why Venditti is so awesome when it comes to this kind of a thing is because when it comes to his stories whether it's a six issue arc whether it's a seven issue arc or even just a two issue arc it's basically here's a quick recap over the course of one page about everything that's happened so far so you don't feel left out especially if you're someone that's not really a huge fan of the Superman comics but you do love Green Lantern the last thing you're looking for is to be put in a position where you have to go and read a comic book that you're not wildly a fan of just to understand what's going on at the moment so it's kind of cool you know Venditti gives us just enough to tell us what's going on but also whets the appetite of the of the average comic book reader and say hey look maybe you do want to go check that out where Superman becomes possessed by parallax which of course if you are interested I have a video on that so feel free to check it out down in the description but again what we saw in that story was that Superman had taken the ring of Sinestro and then confined the parallax entity to it the problem with this is that Hal Jordan suddenly starts kind of hearing this voice in his head and then immediately has this image of Superman becoming parallax and it actually kind of breaks out into a really awesome fight between the two now in truth this is one of those things that people kind of debate from time to time in DC Comics it's almost always referenced that the Green Lantern ring is the most powerful device in the universe not necessarily because of its durability or anything like that but because the constructs that can be created by a Green Lantern are limited only to the mind of the Green Lantern and we've seen that progress over the years in DC Comics you know when you had the original Green Lantern Alan Scott things are pretty basic it was kind of creating these small little constructs here and there they got a little more advanced when Hal Jordan was introduced you had a giant boxing glove you had like wrenches but it really kind of exploded in the realm of creativity with the introduction of Kyle Rayner where he would create these giant mechas and these huge you know I guess super advanced looking constructs and it was really interesting but it really always hit home with the idea that the constructs created by the Green Lanterns are left to the imagination of the Green Lanterns now remember that does not mean the constructs are indestructible there's a difference between a limitless imagination and how those constructs can be made and the indestructible nature of the constructs constructs can be destroyed we've seen that happen before a being of sufficient strength even Superman himself can break out of the constructs of Green Lanterns if they're powerful enough now this is cool because in the battles that we've seen you know especially when it came to something like Emerald Twilight Parallax wrecked Superman in that story but well, you're talking about Hal Jordan who was so incredibly powerful that he was a universal threat when it comes to just traditional Hal Jordan with his Green Lantern constructs you know and just kind of fighting Superman for the most part Superman will usually win and even then it depends on what kind of stories you're talking about for example in the original Justice League story from the new 52 the first six issue story arc Hal Jordan went to go face off against Superman and got wrecked and that version of Superman is not as powerful as the rebirth Superman that we have flowing around right now the one he's fighting at the moment is Parallax and so for the most part this fight should be no contest in a lot of ways but one thing I want you guys to notice is that it does seem to be a contest Superman is not necessarily getting the upper hand here and the reason why the reason this is taking place is because what we end up finding out is this version 
version of Superman as Parallax is an illusion. It's not actually happening. For whatever reason, which well, you know, we'll, we'll talk about here in a second, Hal Jordan's mind is basically being messed with. In reality, he just suddenly attacks Superman. Superman's just kind of like, what are you doing? And he was fighting on the defensive. That's why Hal Jordan wasn't totally obliterated here. Because in Hal Jordan's mind, it was, oh my God, you know, Superman is Parallax. I've got to defeat him. Whereas Superman wasn't fighting to kill him. Superman was fighting in self-defense. And so it was really more of just trying to neutralize him if he can. So again, it's kind of funny, but we end up finding out that these mind games that are being played on Hal Jordan are actually being done by Hector Hammond. Now, this idea of Hector Hammond in this story, I should probably tweet to, tweet to Venditti about this and ask him what's going on. This whole idea of Hector Hammond in DC Rebirth is kind of intriguing because we can take this one of two different ways. We can basically say that everything we saw in the New 52 with Hector Hammond is irrelevant. None of it matters. I would say this is probably classic Hector Hammond. And the reason why is because even before the New 52, Hector Hammond had two different origins. The original origin of Hector Hammond was that he was basically just a guy who came across the ship of Abin Sur, you know, the guy who basically passes Lantern Ring on to uh, Hal Jordan. And Hector Hammond was just kind of hit with the radiation of the ship and it caused his brain to swell up and he gained, you know, additional powers. If you go and you look at the original origin of Hector Hammond from way back in the day when he first showed up, he encountered a meteorite and that's really about it. So there's two different versions there. Now, of course, the one with him coming into contact with the ship of Abin Sur, that is the secret origin of Green Lantern from Jeff Johns. And so for the most part, that's the most recent origin of Hector Hammond. That's probably the one that we can go with. But even then, when we saw the stories of, you know, Green Lantern as it was taken over by Jeff Johns, what basically happened here is we were introduced to the idea that Hector Hammond gaining this sort of enhanced intellect, things like that, that it was a circumstance that was set in play. It wasn't a roll of the dice. It wasn't like it just kind of happened to work out that way. It was one of these things where things were kind of engineered in a particular position so that this sort of experiment that was done by these gremlins of sorts would eventually play itself out. And so the result is that Hector Hammond is really more of a lab rat, if anything else. And these gremlins you're seeing here seem to be kind of a throwback, a return to familiarity with Hector Hammond in regards to Jeff John's run of Green Lantern. Now, remember, when it comes to the whole Green Lantern thing, for those of you guys who are new to all this, when it comes to Green Lantern, it can be a little confusing, which is one of the reasons why we're kind of catching up with it all and we're getting it all sorted out. But the whole idea with this is you basically have everything before Jeff John's when it comes to Green Lantern, everything before Green Lantern Rebirth, the original story where you basically had, you know, the return of Hal Jordan. There were a few stories that took place before that, the last will and testament of Hal Jordan, for example, uh, the story Power of Ion with regards to Kyle Rayner, you know, all these different things that kind of went in there. But with the exception of the smattering of stories by Joe Kelly and different things like that, by and large, you can basically just say, start with Green Lantern Rebirth and read everything after. But regardless of how it is that this is playing out, because of the fact that Hector Hammond was the one that forced the mind of Hal Jordan into hallucinating that Superman had become Parallax, it gets the attention of Hal Jordan and he just kind of realizes what's going on. Now, Hal Jordan and Superman showing up, they face off against these gremlins and they defeat him quick, fast and in a hurry. It's not a great big, huge thing. At least that seems to be the case. But what these gremlins end up doing is they basically kind of jumpstart the mind of Hector Hammond in the sense that all these electrodes have been put in place to allow them to control it to a degree. Now, this is really Venditti kind of introducing new DC Rebirth readers to Hector Hammond in terms of what he's capable of and why it is that he can be so powerful. What ends up happening here is with regards to Hal Jordan, he's basically kind of thrown into this mental simulation of sorts where everything he wanted could basically come true. And that's one of the reasons why this is so intriguing, where it's not necessarily Hal Jordan's father who's returned from the dead or anything like that. He basically envisions a life with like Carol Ferris, spending time with his brother and his, his sister-in-law and, you know, hanging out with their kids and so on and so forth. Now, in truth, for those of you guys who are experienced with Green Lantern, and even those of you guys who are not experienced with Green Lantern, the father of Hal Jordan plays a major role in his life in the sense that everything Hal Jordan does is really kind of predicated on the question, what would my father do? And so if his father were suddenly brought back from the dead, then the motivation for Hal Jordan getting to the place where he is now would be irrevocably different. The basis behind it would be totally changed. The fact that his father died when he was younger was the motivation for Hal Jordan becoming a pilot in the first place. It's one of those things that you can't get, you can't really get rid of. I mean, it's like eliminating the destruction of Krypton and saying, well, Krypton never blew up, you know, well then what reason would there be for Superman to show up on Earth? But for those of you guys who are new to Green Lantern and not familiar with this, Carol Ferris was a long time on again, off again, love interest of Hal Jordan. She eventually became the first star Sapphire, which is to say basically a group of land Lanterns that were formed by the Zamorans who believe that love is the greatest thing ever. And those individuals who are of other members of the Lantern Corps, you know, the Sinestro Corps, something like that, the Zamorans will take them and try to convert them into Star Sapphires. But it's, it's kind of an interesting scenario in terms of how that plays out. But while that love is kind of on again, off again, really in DC Rebirth, we haven't seen hide nor hair of Carol Ferris. And this is a really big thing when it comes to people who are existing Green Lantern fans. So this is really kind of like the first, you know, indication that we get about her character and about what she's about. The problem with this is that for how Jordan, his mind immediately
immediately picks up on the fact that none of this is right. And this really feeds into the willpower of Hal Jordan in the sense that in order for the Green Lanterns to be effective, they have to basically tap into their own willpower and overcome everything, love, fear, the whole nine yards. And so with that in mind, he really just overpowers this mental image to a degree, breaks out of it, you know, and where Superman's still kind of fighting alongside the whole thing, hallucinating his own parents, and he breaks out of it too. We're right back into the fray, we're right back into the conflict. Now, of course, before anything really goes crazy too bad, Hector Hammond kills all the gremlins that are present, and that's really about it. But again, it is kind of cool because this is bringing back a character that we haven't really seen for some time. Of course, Hector Hammond kind of seizes on the mind of, uh, of Superman, tries to get Superman to take him out to basically, you know, kill Hector Hammond himself. It is kind of intriguing and it is cool because it's this great villain who's kind of making his return, or at least that seems to be the case. I mean, ultimately, he's basically kind of throw back, uh, thrown back into Star Labs. They sort of keep him there and it's like, well, these electrodes are in his brain. You know, we don't know what effect they have. We don't even know if they can be removed. We're just going to go ahead and kind of leave them there. Now, this is cool because what it does is it teases the possibility that Hector Hammond can come back more powerful than he ever was before. So it kind of boosts the abilities of Hector Hammond going forward in DC Rebirth. But that's one of the trends that I hope you guys are noticing when it comes to the DC Rebirth landscape is that it's really kind of serving the purpose of either taking existing heroes, amplifying them and taking them back to their original roots or bringing back old school villains. And so it was kind of interesting because all these villains are kind of coming out of the woodwork, which is one of the reasons why I say DC Rebirth is kind of leading up to a crisis. It'll basically be like the Watchmen or Dr. Manhattan versus the DC Universe. This two, three year plan that DC has will eventually hit its finality. And when it does, it'll be some great big, huge, massive event. And then DC will say, and now we're done. And so now what we've done here will be the foundation for the future of DC Comics. I mean, again, it's just really kind of grabbing these little things and sort of, you know, trying to trying to grab the clues and the bits and pieces. Now, again, the idea of Carol Ferris basically being returned to the DC landscape comes by way of how Jordan traveling to her house with the intention of actually trying to rekindle this romance. The problem with this is he's called off by John Stewart of the Green Lanterns, ultimately bails on the decision and really just kind of takes off. And so again, it's Vendetti basically saying, hey, look, all these classic characters from the Green Lantern run, Carol Ferris, Hector Hammond, different things like that, they're all still there. They will make their returns. They will reappear. It's just a matter of time before they do. Okay, so we are getting into, or really kind of picking up again with uh, Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps. It's been a little while since we covered uh, covered this this part of DC Rebirth, but this basically picks up with Zod's will. This is kind of like, you know, basically General Zod wrecking the Green Lanterns, which is actually pretty awesome. But something that I do want to talk about here for a second is the nature of Kryptonian powers, because I've seen this question asked before. So one of the questions that I've that I've seen, and it's actually a really, really good question, if Kryptonians absorb solar radiation, shouldn't Supergirl basically be exactly as powerful as Superman. Like if, if you took 50 Kryptonians and you set them on a singular planet, then shouldn't they all be equally as powerful? Like none is more powerful than the other. And if that's true, then why is it that Supergirl is more powerful than Superman? Why is General Zod less powerful than Superman? Okay, so these are actually some really, really good questions and they're, they're a really cool idea. What this does is begin to kind of answer it. But the whole idea with Supergirl, to kind of address that for a second, pre-crisis, which is to say up until 1985, there was no answer to that. It was just Supergirl's more powerful than Superman because reasons, and and that was basically it. Post-crisis, that was answered by Jeff Johns, I'm pretty sure, back in the mid-2000s when Kara Zor-El first showed up after the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths. And the explanation DC offered was that when she was held in suspended animation, basically, she had like solar radiation bombarding her while she was in her spacecraft. And so she had essentially been absorbing solar radiation for a much longer time than Superman. That's one of the big reasons why there's a differentiating factor. With General Zod, he was consistently shown to have been weaker because he was constantly catching up. He had been locked in the uh, Phantom zone, like, well, you, he was supposed to be in there for eternity, but he had been locked in the Phantom Zone for a very long time. And so while Superman was absorbing solar radiation on Earth, General Zod was just sitting in the Phantom Zone with no no seeming, you know, no way to escape, basically, until he did. And so that's why General Zod is consistently shown to be somewhere near Superman's power or lower than Superman. He's not really shown to be, you know, more powerful than Superman. So hopefully that kind of cleared things up. But what this does is this basically picks up in the aftermath of the whole battle with the controllers. Now, of course, the controllers will return, especially with the, the, the return of the Dark Stars. But again, because of the fact that the controllers were a group of Maltrusians who basically went off and, and did their own thing and became a wholly separate group from the Guardians of the Universe themselves, uh, the controllers kind of went on this campaign to kidnap the Guardians, to convert them, basically to uh, rematerialize them more or less, or, or kind of sap their energy and create more controllers to kind of bring controllers back. Uh, what this did is it led to, you know, Jon Stewart and Hal Jordan and so on and so forth, the various Green Lanterns rescuing the Guardians of the Universe. And so what this means is that the Guardians are basically reforming into their previous roles. But this is a very 
very iffy situation. And the reason for this is because remember, when it came to everything before the New 52, basically the old Jeff Johns run, the Guardians of the Universe were shown to have been a group that was very um, manipulative and housed a lot of secrets. They didn't tell the, the the Green Lanterns everything they wanted to know. And when it came, when it comes to like John Stewart, he initially quits. And he basically decides to quit in the face of the reformation of the Guardians of the Universe. And of course, the, the question they kind of have is, but why though? John Stewart basically says the last time we had a quote unquote, you know, council of the Guardians of the Universe, you guys hid information. You guys ignored the warning signs of the coming, you know, destruction of the of the, of the universe. And it took the, the rise of the Black Lanterns in order for you guys to finally realize things were popping off. It was the idea that the Guardians had become very tyrannical. And so the result is that when John Stewart looks at the reformation of the Guardians of the Universe, his whole idea is we're going back to the way things used to be. And I don't want to be a part of that. Now, here's kind of the cool thing. Ganthet and Sade are old school, right? They're basically the original Guardians of the Universe. All the original Guardians, except for those two, were basically dead. It's a whole new group of Guardians who were there. But this is basically a fresh face, a fresh group of people, with the exception of Ganthet and, uh, Ganthet and Sade. But their whole response is the fact that you realize, John Stewart, that this is a problem is why we need you here. We don't want to become the council that becomes despotic. We want someone to be able to keep us in check. And so it's kind of cool because it's basically meeting halfway. So of course, he's basically sent back out by the Guardians. He's told to essentially just kind of make sure everything is in check. And then of course, uh, they tell him, hey, look, there's a crisis out in the sector somewhere and you got to send some lanterns to check it out. So of course, because this is Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps, Hal Jordan and Kyle Rayner respond. Now, when they get here, there's basically a, a race here that's kind of in the, in the Stone Age, but they're essentially building like this massive kind of citadel of sorts. And we end up finding out all this is being orchestrated by General Zod. Now, this is a very important thing because General Zod is immediately attacked by Hal Jordan and Kyle Rayner. And that's important because they launched the first strike. General Zod did not do anything to provoke this attack. He was simply just there. Now, in reality, it's because General Zod is a Kryptonian bad guy. He always has been. Like he's always done these really, really crappy, terrible things. But at the moment, he's not done anything wrong. And so in reality, what you really have here is Hal Jordan and company showing up on the doorstep of General Zod, whether they knew it or not, and then saying, you're coming with us with nothing to actually charge him with. And so in response, General Zod actually breaks free of the constructs of Hal Jordan. Now, in truth, this shouldn't normally be allowed to happen. But what we end up finding out here is this planet is orbiting two yellow suns. And so what this means is that General Zod has been absorbing twice the amount of solar radiation that he normally has. General Zod's power level has been jumped forward. And that's why we had this discussion at the beginning of the video. It's because where General Zod has been consistently catching up with Superman in the sense that like, you know, Superman gets, you know, he, he just kind of has this level of power and then sometimes he cuts loose, sometimes he doesn't. General Zod has always just been a little bit weaker because he was exposed to solar radiation later than Superman was. But being in a location where he's absorbing twice the radiation, he's basically catching up to Superman very, very, very fast. And at the moment right now, he's equal to Superman in power. And so not only that, and again, not only do we have General Zod here, but going back to like the action comics line of stories, the Superman line of stories, when you had like Eradicator and so on and so forth, Zod still has his own little miniature army. So he's got his wife, he's got his son, and he's got the Eradicator, kind of like this, this old piece of Kryptonian technology is really what he is. But this leads to a, a conflict between Kyle Rayner and Hal Jordan himself. Now, this is very important here because what ends up happening is you basically have the wife of General Zod, who's as powerful as Superman, General Zod himself, who's as powerful as Superman, their son, who's as powerful, and the Eradicator. Hal Jordan and Kyle Rayner do not stand a chance, and they literally get absolutely decimated with the greatest of ease. I mean, they, they are laid waste to in an instant. But in the aftermath of the two of them being captured, of course, they're, they're basically stripped of their rings, and they're, you know, at least Hal Jordan is taken before General Zod. Now, this is kind of the funny thing here. When it comes to Zod as a character, this is one of the reasons why I always liked him so much. Historically speaking, when it comes to comics, you know, the good, good guys are good guys, bad guys are bad guys. What makes bad guys interesting are the motivations behind what they do, what they do, or why they do what they do, but also, like, who they are and how they're inherently written. Some bad guys are just bad guys. Like, Electro was never really an interesting villain in the Spider-Man mythos until he, like, took down Power to the Raft and freed all the supervillains. But, like, Magneto's always been interesting because his character has evolved and changed so much over the years. General Zod is much the same way. When Hal Jordan's brought before Zod, it's not so Zod can just start pummeling him and saying, tell me what I want to know. It's because Zod is just kind of like, let's sit down and have a conversation. Let's talk. Now, in reality, Hal Jordan's just kind of like, I don't want to hear it. You're a bad guy. You got to go. That's one of the reasons why this is interesting in the way that it's written because you look at this and Hal Jordan almost seems to be like the antagonist here whereas you just kind of have General Zod here on this planet now because Zod is a villain you can't help but wonder what it is that he's up to but it is kind of intriguing now the other half of this is that General Zod does not know how the ring of Hal Jordan works the ring that Hal Jordan wields right now is not the ring that he historically wielded Hal Jordan forged his ring out of pure willpower it's part and parcel to himself basically Hal Jordan's ring is like his arm or his leg or his brain or something along those lines and so because it's tied in 
inherently to his willpower, he's able to literally command the ring and uh, have it break directly out of its cell and return to him. And so what he ends up doing is basically flying back to Kyle Rayner. And this is when we realize that when it comes to like this group here, this group that, that it's believed that, uh, that General Zod is kind of oppressing and forcing into slave labor, it's not actually that way. Instead, these guys worship General Zod. Now, this kind of invokes a whole idea of like the Star Trek Prime Directive, right? I mean, like, like if you're you know, in the Star Trek universe, the Prime Directive is you cannot interact with races that, ha that have not achieved interstellar travel. You have to allow them to continue on their own their own path until they eventually discover faster than light travel and then from there uh you know then you can interact with them with this whole situation here it's this idea if we start messing around with these guys if we start causing problems then what we basically do here is we kind of obstruct the the progression of this race but this race looks at general zod sees him as a guy who can fly who's got like super speed strength so on and so forth and they see him as a god and the result is that they worship him as a god and zod has essentially been using that to get them to do work for him he's not been forcing them into oppression if anything, he's kind of manipulating them. But manipulating someone is not an illegal act. He hasn't actually done anything wrong here. And so the result is that with General Zod just kind of like, okay, look, you know, we got to take care of these two Green Lanterns. Hal Jordan essentially like binds his ring directly to Kyle Rayner, transforming him into something akin to like an infinite lantern, basically, and then sending Kyle Rayner back to uh, back to Oa. And so it's kind of cool because Kyle Rayner is actually bond, uh, bonded with pure willpower. Now, the problem with this is that because it is such an extreme level of power, Kyle's trying to adapt to it. But this power Power, this this pure willpower that he's getting is actually like kind of overriding his senses and what I mean by that is that he's suffering from like a, a lacerated liver he's got broken ribs by all standards of measurement he should be like recovering and in surgery right now but this willpower he's receiving is kind of amplifying him up to the extreme where it just like overrides all those sensations and so basically he feels no pain he's just totally gassed up and ready to go the other funny thing about this is because because of the fact that he's bonded with Hal Jordan's willpower he's spouting off Hal Jordan quotes <laughs> He's saying things Hal Jordan would say. But at this point, we kind of switch back over to the to the Guardians of the Universe themselves. And again, this is why the whole situation with Jon Stewart is somewhat tenuous, because Jon Stewart is getting what he wanted. He's just realizing that it's not really what he wanted. Basically, what he's getting is not what he had hoped for. With the Guardians of the Universe, and, and back in the old days, they would have just been like, go get Hal Jordan, done. And that would have been it. And they would have said, get him back by any means necessary. You know, you have leave to do whatever you have to do. And they would have fought General Zod. It would have been kind of a cool battle for a few minutes. And then they would have won, and they would have brought Hal Jordan and Kyle, you know, Rod Hal Jordan back. With this new Guardians, a uh, new Guardian Council, their whole stance is we can't be so quick to judgment. And so we basically have to deliberate. And for Jon Stewart, it's so frustrating because it's like, but it's one of our lanterns though. And that's kind of the big differentiating factor between the Guardians of the Universe and like normal people. A normal human being is basically primitive. Like we're pretty basic, we're pretty emotional. We're not that bright in the grand scheme of things. Like people have a tendency to let their emotions override their common sense. And so with that in mind, the Guardians are just kind of like, okay, but like, you know, I, I realize that you want to go get Hal Jordan, but like you're an idiot though, because like you're very emotional uh, and you're not as wise as we are because we've been around for like a, like three billion years or something along those lines. So like let our three billion years of wisdom kind of play out here. And then when you've been alive for three billion years then you can kind of play that role, you know, when 900 years you reach, you know, look how good, you know, look good you will not or whatever the hell it was you would have said to Luke Skywalker. So with this whole thing, John's kind of response is, but we have to rescue Hal though. And this is one of the reasons why John Stewart is so cool, but also one of the reasons why the, the kind of antagonistic nature of the Green Lanterns and the, the Guardians of the Universe work so well. Because a lot of the Green, or really the Earthbound Green Lanterns, for the most part, want to have their cake and eat it too. We need to be logical. We need to think things out unless it's something I really, really want. Then we should just do that. But like, if it's not something that, what I, that I really, really want, well then yeah, just let things play out and we'll just kind of see what happens. I mean, it, it's one of those things where you can't have it both ways. And so the result is that Jon Stewart kind of takes off, but he does exactly what you would expect he'd do. Guy Gardner, of course, Guy Gardner being Guy Gardner, uh, basically goes and grabs the other, you know, a, kind of a, a core member of the Green Lantern lanterns and says, we got to go rescue Hal Jordan. And then essentially takes off and Jon Stewart's like, I didn't see anything. And so it was kind of interesting here because what, what's happening the entire time this is going on is Kyle Rayner's ring is still with General Zod. And so General Zod is actually going through and, and having the Eradicator analyze the ring. But of course, then all the Green Lanterns show up and they basically end up facing off against General Zod. Now, again, with Kyle Rayner wielding essentially the, the power of two Green Lanterns, it is kind of cool here because when he shows up, it is an extreme level of, of willpower that he has at his disposal. And for the most part, 
he's able to hold his own to a degree. The problem with this is that again, you're talking about Kryptonians that are twice as powerful as they normally are. Not only that, they're actually fighting with restraint. They're just kind of like, hey, like hold back a little bit and let's just kind of see what happens and let's let's just sort of keep them at bay. Because what they're doing is basically stalling. That's really all they're doing here. And that's kind of interesting because when you're watching these Kryptonians stall against the Green Lanterns, yet still hold their own against the Green Lanterns, the question has to become, so like what happens when they go when they go ham? Like what happens when he just like flat out loses it? And so for a minute, General Zod does that when he literally like punches out Kyle Rayner and sends him flying. And that's why I say this is so awesome because it kind of gives us like this full brunt concept of like what would happen if a full on Kryptonian faced off against a, a Green Lantern and that Kryptonian is just like basically Superman level power with no no real reason to hold back. This is a pretty cool moment here because how you know, how Jordan kind of reaches out and says, look, you can't keep tampering with this power. Like I gave it to you so you can get away, but you have no idea what impact this level of power is going to have on your body. You don't know if it'll kill you. And so for a minute, how Jordan, like what he actually does is he kind of, you know, tries to reason with, with Kyle and then basically strips his willpower back from Kyle, reverting him to his normal form, kind of amplifies it a bit. And then in turn, like grabs his willpower, brings it back and uh, his ring returns to himself. And then of course, you know, how Jordan arrives on the scene. Now, of course, this is after like all the Kryptonians have decimated all the other Green Lanterns. And so it's really one of these things where like Hal Jordan is the last man standing. Now, again, when you're talking about Hal Jordan fighting here against General Zod, it's kind of a, a continuation of that whole discussion that we had earlier. Well, of course, General Zod being as powerful as Superman, he crushed Hal Jordan before he should be able to crush him now, but it doesn't work that way. Because what Hal Jordan kind of says here is, look, I wasn't prepared to fight a Kryptonian who, who had been exposed to this much solar radiation. I didn't expect to see you fighting here. And now it's one of those comic book cop-outs. It works, but it's one of those things that writers kind of use to sort of adjust the story a little bit. But in turn, like it's, it's, it's basically the willpower of Hal Jordan facing off against the full power of General Zod, essentially facing off against Superman here. And it's awesome because the ring allows a person to do whatever they want to do. It allows their imagination to run wild, but the ring is only as powerful as the willpower of the person who wields it. But with with uh, with Hal Jordan, it's a wholly separate circumstance because the ring is an extension of himself. And so the ring is his willpower. It's not just a thing that was given to him. And so he's basically fighting with his mind, body, and soul. And that's why this is so cool is because he's able to hold his own pretty damn well against General Zod and actually able to like beat the crap out of him. Now, the other thing to remember here is that General Zod is a master strategist. The issue with General Zod is that by and large, most of his battles have been confined to Superman or like Wonder Woman or something along those lines because he's historically been a Superman villain. Superman is more of, of just like hardcore punching and different things like that and kind of thinking about things from a different perspective. But that's always been the nature of Zod versus Superman, the military strategist versus the guy who just punches things. And so when it comes to this whole situation, Hal Jordan, his experience when it comes to like various forms of military combat is he is well versed in this. Not only that, he thinks about things with a little bit more imagination. And the reason why I say this is that when he's facing off against Zod and sending all these different, you know, uh, these different hard light constructs in the form of like jets toward him, General Zod is kind of thinking about it in a two dimensional space. There's there's front and there's back. With Hal Jordan, however, he just kind of sits around and he says, one of the most important things the Air Force taught me is that there is no real up and down. I mean, there's up and down in so much as you have a ground and a sky, but like fights are three dimensional. And so you have to see things around you at all times. And so that's when Zod begins to turn around and realize that like all these different things are coming at him from every single direction. Now, it's not enough to destroy Zod, but it is enough to take him by surprise. And that's a pretty significant feat because when that happens, it basically allows Hal Jordan to take him prisoner. Now, as soon as this happens, the Green Lanterns pop up and say, you have to let him go. He hasn't actually broken any laws here. So there's nothing that we can do. Because of that, he's essentially let go here. Uh, but it's kind of cool because General Zod's response is, we don't want you here. Now, this is the biggest motivation for why General Zod is doing all this. Though the whole the whole purpose of General Zod, the whole way he perceives this is that Tomar Ray was the Green Lantern of the sector that Krypton was in when Krypton blew up. And so Zod has always held a hatred for Green Lanterns because of the simple fact that the Green Lantern that he perceives that, that Tomar Ray had failed. That Tomar Ray had basically screwed up and allowed Krypton to be destroyed. And so in his mind, he's like, we rebuke your protection. Like, do whatever you want to do in this sector, but do not come here. And it works because what it means is that he would be able to sort of function with autonomy, that nobody can really interfere in what it is that he has going on. The other half of this is that for Zod, the reason why he was analyzing the ring of, of Kyle Rayner, which of course was returned to Kyle Rayner and, you know, they were all kind of allowed to go free, is that what Zod wanted was the information stored inside the ring, which no one really seemed to ask the question of what he was doing with the ring. But what Zod was doing, going through and analyzing the ring, he essentially has a map of the universe now. He has a map of every single race in the universe, every single planet in the universe, the weapons capabilities of those races on those planets, how many Green Lanterns there are, where the Green Lanterns are stationed at, all the goings on that exist inside the universe right now. And what it means is he has every conceivable piece of information he would need from a military 
military strategic standpoint, that's a gold mine. If you're a military strategist and you can know what the enemy's weapons are, you can know where the weapons are, and you can know how to attack those weapons without being seen, you've basically won the war, especially if they don't know that you have that information because then you can, you can implement that in any conceivable way that you want to. And so what this does right now is it makes General Zod quite possibly the most dangerous being in the universe. But something else that I want you guys to consider, this is kind of a war, this is kind of an interesting scenario because it sort of points to the idea of what direction uh, Hal Jordan might be going in. It's one panel, it's not very long, but, but Hal Jordan starts talking to Jon Stewart about the idea of ending villains permanently. He's just kind of like, what do you think about the idea that like, if we got rid of villains, like if, if we faced off against a villain and they were gone for good, would that really be a bad thing? And in reality, it wouldn't. A dead man cannot be a repeat offender. Hal Jordan is not really wrong here. It's not necessarily the worst idea to kill every criminal who commits a crime. The problem with this is like evidence and, and different things like that. It is kind of interesting. And, you know, and it kind of points to the idea that Hal Jordan is sort of falling down this road of possibly becoming a bad guy. We don't really know. Okay, so we are covering Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps, and uh, this is like the next to last story arc. If if the solicitations are to be believed, then basically Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps will end at issue number 50. I think Green Lanterns is ending at the same issue, and then they're both going to combine. What they're going to do with the rest of the titles, I don't really know. Uh, but for some reason, DC has an affinity for the number 52, right? It was like New 52, they have 52 universes. Uh, when New 52 kicked off, all the issues ran for 52 issues until DC Rebirth happened. DC loves the number 52. It's like the number seven from Harry Potter. But anyway, what this does is this initially picks up uh, with, well, really with the Dark Stars. Now, the whole idea of the of the Dark Stars, the, the basis behind them, is that in the early 1990s, around 1992, I think it was, uh, DC was trying to find a way to reinvigorate the interest in the Green Lantern stories. Because remember, we talked about this in Hal Jordan Explained from, you know, two years ago, whenever it was. But Hal Jordan, despite the fact that he, alongside Barry Allen, had helped to reinvigorate interest in comic books in the 1950s, he basically dropped off in popularity relatively fast like within 10 years he was not very popular at all and in fact he was a backup feature in the flash for a while and so before dc had the idea to kill him off and to or i guess to get rid of hal jordan to basically write him out with uh the whole event of emerald twilight one of the things they did was create the dark stars and the dark stars were going to be this sort of like new core so think of it as akin to what jeff johns did with all the lantern cores before jeff johns and they were basically created by a group called the controllers we'll talk a little bit about the controllers here in a second but back then uh in the 90s the controllers were just like an offshoot of the Guardians of the Universe. They were just, uh, they were all Maltusians at one point, but they had just gone a different direction. They become a lot more reclusive and a lot more extreme and heavy handed in terms of how they believe the order or the universe should be governed. Instead of having the Green Lanterns as a police force, as a peacekeeping force, the Dark Stars were really extremists in a lot of ways. Now, of course, this eventually sort of began to fall to the wayside after the events of uh, Emerald Twilight. And of course, DC started going into new crises with Infinite Crisis and Final Crisis and so on and so forth. Uh, but the return of the Dark Stars here in DC Re Rebirth, what Venditti is doing is, is making them a little more extreme and simply saying that they have taken up this mantle uh, by way of the controllers yet again. The difference is that where the Dark Stars used to operate under the control of the controllers, now they operate independently. They basically use the controllers for their own ends, harnessing their psychic powers and then functioning as their own core, more or less. And instead of being like the Green Lanterns where they function in more of a peacekeeping capacity, they're basically all like the Punisher. They just kill everyone. In this instance, what had happened is Tomar II, who was formerly a Green Lantern, had defected to the Dark Stars and then taken over the leadership of the team. Now, the reason why this matters is because when he takes out Goldface, who was basically a background guy, he's like a C-list level villain, but he had killed Tomar Ray during Infinite Crisis, I think it was. And so Tomar Ray, of course, was the father of Tomar II. And that's why Tomar II kills Goldface, because he basically says, you are going to die for the crime that you committed. And that's the nature of the Dark Stars. It's extreme and it's hardcore. And so when Hal Jordan arrives on the scene and starts going through and basically analyzing the bones of Goldface, he essentially realizes, look, this was done by a Dark Star. And that's what really turns his attention here, because what it means is the Dark Stars have become active. They've one, returned, and two, begun initiating their campaigns. And much like the Green Lanterns, which we'll see here in a little bit, the Dark Stars can actually bring people to their cause. They can make, they can turn them into Dark Stars. And so where Barry Allen shows up, initially, you know, is a, a cool conversation between the two, because one of the things that Hal Jordan has been suffering from, and this is something that I think the Venditti and them are really kind of moving, uh, moving back towards, is that Hal Jordan might become Parallax again. And the reason why is is because he's had a lot of negative thoughts when it's come to his role as a superhero, when it's come to the various supervillains that are out there. And one of the big things he's talked about is, is it really a bad thing if we kill people who commit crimes? A dead man can't
can't be a repeat offender. It's an extreme perception, but there is some, some legitimacy and merit to it. And so in response to this, you know, Barry Allen kind of talks him down a little bit, but this has been an ongoing theme with Hal Jordan since the events of Dark Knight's Metal. And even before that, Hal Jordan has routinely seen death and destruction over and over and over again. And the question he has to ask is, what's the point of being a cop if we're always late? Would it really be a bad thing to stop the crimes before they happen? And it's one of the things that he says to Hal, I get where you're coming from, but these thoughts can't lead anywhere but bad. It could lead you back to that dark place that you were before. And Hal Jordan's response is, yeah, but that might not be the worst thing. And so it's 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 interesting here. It's a great exchange between the two. It's one of the reasons why The Flash and Hal Jordan have always bounced off each other so well in terms of how they were written, because they're, the, the character interactions between the two, not really the battles they fight alongside in or anything like that, but the conversations between the two are what make them so interesting. And so picking up with Guy Gardner, we end up having Guy show up to a bar only to be met by Arkillo. Now, again, for those of you guys who are playing a little bit of catch up here, if you saw my previous videos, Arkillo was a long standing member of the Sinestro Corps for a very, very long time, one of its very first members. And so where he had gone through and routinely been a bad guy, as Jeff John's run, you know, basically reached its conclusion, or at least when he was writing it, and then Robert Venditti took over, and then DC Rebirth happened, we started to see this kind of shift between the two. Most notably, we saw where the Sinestro Corps and the Green Lantern Corps teamed up, and where there was a lot of bitterness and anger between the two groups. For Arkillo and Guy Gardner, they actually became close friends. So this whole thing between the two, this is really what kind of boils down to like a back alley deal. They're really not supposed to be meeting with each other. For the Green Lanterns, they don't really mind. But for the Sinestro Corps, it's you do not meet with Green Lanterns, you do not associate with them, talk to them. If you see one, you kill them. But with Guy Gardner and Arkillo talking to each other, Guy Gardner basically says, look, man, there's a much bigger threat out there. The Dark Stars are rising and the Dark Stars do not have a moral compass. They don't believe in truth and justice or any of that stuff. They believe that if you commit a crime, you're guilty and you're done. And that's it. And, and so it's 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 extreme. It's, it's really heavy handed. And that's kind of what Guy Gardner says. Because of what's going on with the Dark Stars rising, there's essentially this point now where the Green Lanterns are, are, are sending out what amounts to an SOS. Every single ally that's out there, they are running and they are grabbing, except for the ones based on Earth for the most part. Uh, but you have uh, Kyle Rayner transition to him where he meets up with Cabby. Now again, Cabby is basically the Han Solo of the DC universe. It's really what he is and it's cool. But one of the things that's happened here is that he's basically modified his ship because he would travel throughout the known universe uh, and he was basically a guy that would get people to places where they weren't supposed to be or get them through like back channels and so on and so forth. But for what Guy Gardner needs, they have to leave the current universe. And so what's happened here is Cabby has basically bought a, uh, a mother box essentially on the black market, which would allow him to leave the universe and travel to the realm of the new gods. And that's exactly what happens. What they end up doing is traveling directly to where the new gods are located at. Now, of course, again, uh, kind of transitioning from there, we pick up with Jon Stewart in what's probably one of the greatest moments ever. <laughs> when he shows up here, he shows up to basically gain the aid of General Zod, which is a difficult thing to do. But the funny thing about this is that where Zod immediately goes to attack, Jon Stewart cracks him in the hand with brass knuckles. And initially, it seems like the brass knuckles are made out of a hard like construct, but they're not. They're actually brass knuckles made of kryptonite. Now, that's just the most boss ass thing I've ever heard of. It's beast. Like using brass knuckles made of kryptonite is like one of the coolest things ever. It's, it's like this genius idea. And so it's basically Jon Stewart saying, hey, look, man, do I have your attention now? Because we need to have a conversation. You know, I've got kryptonite here. So if I bring it close enough, it's only a matter of time before you die. So either we can talk or you can die. From, from here, we transition over to uh, basically Stryker Island Penitentiary and we end up picking up with Hector Hammond. Now, Hector Hammond has been a background character in the Green Lantern stories for quite some time. And the reason why was because he played a very significant role when it came to like the War of the Green Lanterns, different things like that, Brightest Day, so on and so forth. And so because of that, it was really, I imagine, a desire of Venditti to break away from the quote unquote traditional villains of the Green Lantern mythos and start focusing on other things. And so for the most part, Hector Hammond has just kind of been in the background the whole time, just sort of sitting in Strikers Island. But with Hal Jordan showing up here, what it means is that times are dire because Hector Hammond's not a guy that you just trifle with. He's not a guy you just wake up. And we'll find out why here in a little bit because what ends up happening is basically Hal Jordan is met by the arrival of Atomic Skull. Now, Atomic Skull has been the name of a couple different people, but the most notable one and the one that's, that's here is Joseph Martin. And the reason why I say the most notable is because that's essentially the most popular one post-crisis. When it comes to Joseph Martin, he is a guy uh, really whose, whose strength durability uh, is really on par with like Superman. Like he's really, really capable. But the way he he gained his powers was from the Dominator storyline back in the post-crisis landscape, which was them activating the gene bomb. It was DC's attempt to sort of quote unquote, create a mutant kind concept. The gene bomb was a way for DC to basically kind of usher in this huge explosion of powers into the DC universe landscape and then just kind of pick and choose who got to have what and, and try to build up heroes and villains from there. That's really where Atomic Skull comes from. But again, transitioning back over, we end up having this Green Lantern who's basically traveling to their destination. And this is 
really just Venditti showing us how extreme the Dark Stars are. Because when this Green Lantern is transporting a guy who's guilty of murder, the Green Lantern basically tells the Dark Stars, look, you guys got to get out of here. You're pretenders. You guys have no idea what you're doing. At which point, this guy is basically blown to pieces. The prisoner himself is completely destroyed. And that's the end of this guy. So it's really designed to say, like, the Dark Stars are pretty lethal. Now, of course, with Atomic Skull facing off against Hal Jordan, not a whole lot doing here. It's just kind of Atomic Skull doing what Atomic Skull does. He's essentially a good guy now. He's basically a warden for the prison and, uh, you know, keeping control of the inmates. But of course, where, where it looks like he's going to get the better half of, uh, or I guess get the upper hand on, on Hal Jordan, Hector Hammond wakes up and essentially like shuts down the mind of Atomic Skull. And that's really the end of him. And so again, it's kind of a cool thing, but it's basically this idea that like John Stewart pulls some pretty underhanded things because switching, switching back to him, this is one of the important things about John Stewart. For the most part, before he became leader of the Green Lantern Corps, John Stewart was in a lot of ways by the book. Now, it didn't mean he never broke the rules, but it does mean that for the most part, he followed the rules. But becoming leader of the Green Lantern Corps means that sometimes you have to come to the realization that some rules are meant to be bent and others can be broken, to quote the Matrix. And so with this whole thing, he basically approaches Zod and says, look, we know you hate Green Lanterns. You blame Green Lanterns for the destruction of Krypton. You ask the question, where was it? Where was Krypton's Green Lantern when the, when the planet was destroyed? And that's a valid question. Tomar Ray was nowhere to be found. You can't take your vengeance on Tomar Ray because he's dead. So you take your vengeance on the entire Green Lantern. Lantern Corps. But what if I told you, you could have your vengeance on Tomar too? Now, on the surface, it seems kind of like, well, I mean, that's par for the course. But when you're someone like Jon Stewart, who is for the most part, honor, duty, and loyalty first, it's one of these things where he sort of betrays a bit of honor. He just kind of cast that aside for a second, but it's a small sacrifice for a much bigger win. And so it's really necessary here. I mean, things are just that drastic. And that's what this is designed to show. It's designed to show how drastic things are that Jon Stewart would take this step. And so ultimately he gains the attention of General Zod who says, okay, let's, let's have this conversation. Let's, let's sit down and let's talk and let's see what's going on. And so at this moment, we switch back over to Arkillo and, uh, and Guy Gardner. And they're basically met with the arrival of the Dark Stars, basically Tomar, uh, Tomar 2 and the Dark Stars. Now it's kind of cool because this is how the Dark Stars swindle people to their path. The Dark Stars' base desire is, it's almost primal. Imagine a modified Red Lantern ring. It's kind of how this seems. With a Red Lantern ring, when you're when you're chosen, when it's just like, you know, you have great rage in your heart, you belong to the Red Lanterns, and the ring bonds itself to you, uh, all this really means is that you just kind of revert to a very primal state, and all you do is just take orders. With the Dark Stars, you're still capable and, ra and, and you're still capable of rational thought, but you bend to your own extreme desires. And that really kind of complements the purpose of the Dark Stars, which is to eliminate everybody who commits murder, to have no real inhibitions about taking life of those you deem to be guilty. And so with Guy Gardner himself, he's approached by Tomar too, who says, look, we both came from bad situations and we've we've both dealt with the shame of our fathers in a lot of different ways. So I give you the opportunity, would you like to take revenge on your father for what he's done? And Guy Gardner's response is yes. And so this is when he's immediately bonded with the Dark Star Exo Mantle, basically, and is made into one of their group. So again, Guy Gardner is the first Green Lantern to fall prey to the Dark Stars. Now, of course, with Hector Hammond and uh, and and Hal Jordan, they essentially just kind of like race off, you know. It's, and it's kind of cool because when it comes to Hector Hammond, he'd always idolized Hal Jordan, right? I mean, that was one of, that was one of the funny things about his character is that when Hector Hammond first met Hal Jordan, he considered him to be just somewhat of a goof. Really, once Hector realized he was the Green Lantern, it was always Hector sort of chasing after him, trying to be the hero that Hal Jordan was. Because in the mind of Hector, it was the heroes get the girls, the heroes are the brave guys, they get the adoration, they get the fame, they get all that kind of stuff. I want that, so I should be a hero. But it was particular attention to Hal Jordan himself. And so that's why, you know, Hector Hammond has always kind of been like the ultimate fan, even if a little bit extreme and a little bit, you know, weird in terms of how he does it. He's always kind of been the ultimate fan. And so that's why he's, he's along for the ride, but he kind of celebrates the chance to face off alongside Hal Jordan. Now, Hal Jordan's not too happy about it. You know, it's just something that he needs to do because of the power Hector Hammond has with his telepathic abilities having been enhanced recently. And so again, picking up with the father of, uh, of, of Guy Gardner with Roland Gardner, Gardner, this is actually interesting because Guy Gardner shows up and says, Roland Gardner, you know, you used to be the crap out of me. Your penalty is death. And this is intense because Guy Gardner has just kind of fallen down to his darker side. And so again, switching back to Hector and, and Hal Jordan, this is, this is a really, really awesome exchange here because what happens is Hector basically starts talking to, to Hal and says, look, I can do anything with my powers. Like, like anything that you 
want me to do, I can basically create all manner of illusions. In this instance, he shows Hal Jordan, all of the villains in the DC universe who have all been killed by Hector Hammond. And Hal Jordan kind of freaks out about that and says, this is ridiculous. I don't want to do anything like that. And Hector's response is, yes, you do. I've read your mind. This is what you truly want. Now, this is not Hector Hammond being manipulative. At the moment, this is the most visceral and real thing that Hal Jordan feels. Hal Jordan wants to see the death of all the villains on a base level. Hal Jordan becoming Parallax is only a matter of time because he's falling back down to this path of just darkness and doing whatever it takes to win. And so when Hal says, look, you don't know what you're talking about. None of this is true. Hector says, I always listen. I hear everything. Just because I'm unconscious doesn't mean my brain is unconscious. I hear everything that goes on. And it kind of flashes back to the conversation that, that Hal Jordan had with Superman at the end of uh, Dark Knight's Metal when he, when, he, when he talks to him and says, maybe it wouldn't be the worst thing to destroy all the villains. Like I could kill Hector Hammond right now. And would anybody really care? Again, that darkness is showing itself. That darker side of Hal Jordan is kind of coming back. And so Hector's response is, don't worry, Hal, I will fix everything. I will make everything okay. I will take care of all the villains for you and you won't have any blood on your hands. All I need for you to do is to stay out of the way. And he does this by wiping the mind of Hal Jordan to where Hal Jordan doesn't remember anything about himself, doesn't know his name, doesn't know his power or anything. His mind is completely and totally wiped. And it's just like, wow. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy to see that happen. Now, the other half of this is that with the Dark Stars themselves, one of the things that they do is they basically teleport in and teleport out. And so this makes them exceedingly difficult to catch. No one really knows exactly where they're going to, but just to say they don't know if they're teleporting to a location to one planet to take care of somebody and then teleporting to another planet. And there's a lot of space out there. The only way to really be able to know where they're going is to have a Green Lantern set at every single planet in every single star system across the entire universe in every single galaxy, which is impossible. It's, it's absolutely unreasonable to try to do that. It would require massive, like just an astronomical number of, of, of beings in order to make that happen. And so in response to this, what ends up happening is John Stewart hits up, uh, you know, General Zod and says, look, what do you know about teleportation disrupting technology? And when it comes to Zod, he says, well, like most other things in Krypton, they were lost to time, but it would take weeks. I mean, we can recreate one, but it would take a long time. And John Stewart's response is, I was an architect, home slice, just wait and watch what I do. And it's the coolest thing. He did, he basically recreates the whole thing using using Green Lantern tech. And it's, it's cool. Like it's, it's pretty badass to see. <laughs> but jumping back to Guy Gardner here, one of the cool things is that where he, I mean, not really cool, that he's getting ready to, you know, kill his dad. Arkillo flies in and basically stops him. Now, this is not Arkillo looking for a tried and true fight. He's doing this as a friend. You know, he's, he's stepping in. It's, it's, it's like it's like punching a drunk friend in the face in order to get them to calm down and keep them from doing something stupid. That's what his whole stance is here. You do not want to kill your pops. You think you do, and this Dark Star energy is telling you to, but you don't really want to, because if you do this, the instant it happens, you're going to regret it. You're going to have crossed the line that you can't come back from. And it is my duty as your friend to keep you from crossing that line. Now, the fight between the two is pretty knocked down and drag out because it's Arkillo really fighting more on a defensive side and Guy Gardner fighting more on the offense. Of course, the reason why with Arkillo fighting defense is because he's not looking to kill Guy Gardner. He's looking to incapacitate him to defeat him. But because of the fact that it's really Arkillo fighting, uh, fighting in a, a, a defensive way, it's him trying to reason with Guy. One of the things he said, says here is, look, there was a time when I was beyond redemption. I murdered, I, I did all manner of things that, that simply did nothing more than make me happy. And the Sinestro Accord, you know, basically fed into that. It gave me the ability to, to instill fear across the universe, which made me one of the most feared beings in the entirety of the universe. And I kept doing what I do, only doing it with more power. But you, Guy Gardner, showed me a better way. You showed me a better path. And your father deserves that same redemption. Your father deserves the chance to be seen, to be shown a better path if he hasn't found it already. But if you really believe that that all this was a waste, if you really believe that I as Arkillo am, am incapable of being redeemed, if you really believe that I'm putting on an act, that I'm faking it, that none of this is true, then kill your father. But if you truly believe that I am a good guy, if you truly believe that I have redeemed myself, then you have to believe your father can too. And that 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 right there hits right in the feels, gets Guy Gardner right in the feels. And what it does is it amps up his uh, his willpower and overpowers the Dark Star Exo Mantle. So this is one of the cool caveats that Vendetti puts in here. If a Green Lantern has enough willpower, power, they can override the Dark Star Exo Mantle. It's a, basically a way of saying it's their it's their escape. Now, what it also means is it takes a lot of willpower. It's awesome to see this unfold. Now, of course, this leads to kind of a quick goodbye. Hey, Pop, sorry for killing you. We'll grab a cup, a cup of coffee when I get back. Peace. Like, it's basically him bailing out. <laughs>
<laughs> it's essentially him just kind of taking off. And so jumping over, you know, jumping back to Hal Jordan again, this is why things are so cool. Because Hal Jordan, as he's trying to figure out who he is, and as he feels confused, he's met by this sort of disembodied voice that says, do not listen to Hector Hammond. Ignore Hector Hammond. He's duping you. He's lying to you. This is what he does. And as, as, as Hector Hammond tries to combat this voice, this voice keeps getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And this is when we end up finding out this planet that they've been on is a planet where Hal Jordan forged his own ring. Now, this is important because this happened at the very beginning of, of, of Green Lantern Rebirth. Hal Jordan was basically a renegade. He was an outcast. He had taken the fall for the Green Lantern Corps and essentially said, like, I'm the reason they did all these, these things and so on and so forth. But the fact remains, what ended up happening is like no other Green Lantern had ever done before him, what he managed to do was forge a ring out of his own willpower. His willpower was so strong, he forged a ring out of it. I mean, it would be like you really needing a pencil and just fabricating one out of thin air out of your need to have one. Like it's, it's, that's exactly what he did. And so because of this, his willpower in this planet is inherently strong. This planet is part and parcel to him. And so his willpower is dormant here. It lays here. And that's what this willpower says. The reason why we brought Hector Hammond to this world is because we knew he would try to mess with our mind. And we needed to be in a place where our willpower was so extreme that we could overcome insurmountable odds. And so Hal Jordan basically remerges with his own willpower, regains every ounce of himself. And then of course, Hector Hammond reveals what's truly going on. With Hector being here, what he says is these beings that you're facing off against, these dark stars do not care about right and wrong. They don't care about moral compasses. They don't care about how you define truth and justice. All they care about is that a person committed a crime, that person has to die. And when you're facing off against them, you're going to be met with your own worst demons, your own worst fears. You're going to be met with all these parts of yourself that you're going to think have long since been lost and they weren't. They were there all the time. You just never dealt with them. You had to face your own fear. This was Hector Hammond helping out Hal Jordan in a very, very, very big way, a very important way. Because what it means now is that Hal Jordan is stronger with his willpower. It means that he knows what to expect in this fight against the Dark Stars, and he won't really be taken by surprise. And what, what Hector kind of says here is that it's not the things that you that you believe. It's not your moral compass or anything like that that define you as a hero. It's what you do. Just because you believe that people should be saved doesn't mean you'll save them. It's the belief you'll save them and then actually going out and saving them that makes you a hero. That's what makes you who you are, and it's the only thing that matters. You cast aside these darker feelings. You cast aside this idea that people who all committed crime should basically be eliminated. And so he's kind of one step away from Parallax. Now notice this, Vendetti doesn't say he'll never become Parallax. He's just kind of a step away from where he was before. And so it was kind of a cool thing. But in the middle of all this, we end up trans you know, transitioning back to Mogo with Kilowog, who basically sounds the SOS because the Dark Stars have been attacking the Green Lanterns everywhere they find them. And so in this instance, Kilowog kind of says, okay, we need everybody to come back here. And the reason why is because the Dark Stars have surrounded the entire planet of Mogo, and if given the ability to do so, they will destroy everyone here. Okay, so we are, uh, we're wrapping up Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps. Here's a funny thing. This is it. This is the end of Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps in DC Rebirth. At least I'm pretty sure it is. Uh, it's the final issue. From what I understand, what they're doing is they're combining Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps with Green Lanterns. And so going forward, this is going to be the new story, which is kind of interesting because as I understand it, Doomsday Clock was supposed to have been done by now or within the next month or two. And it's not. They've had to, they've kind of had to extend it out in order to make, uh, make time for the art, which I don't care. Gary Frank is an amazing artist. Oh, wait until the end of time to see the end of that story or until the day I die to see the end of that story if it means Gary Frank will keep drawing. Gary Frank, take as much time as you need, man. Dude, your art is amazing. <laughs> but uh, but nonetheless, so so basically this is the end of Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps. And so aptly, this is called the last charge of the Green Lanterns, which I think is an amazing name. But it's kind of cool because what this does is it kind of picks up with a little bit of a narrative of sorts. It really picks up with the nature of the Green Lantern Corps from the perspective of Tomar 2. And it's not the most significant thing, but it is kind of cool because what Tomar 2 basically Basically says here is like when he was younger he watched his father as a Green Lantern and and it was it was awe inspiring and so with Tomar 2 giving us this bit of an explanation what we know is that of course his father died and Tomar 2 took his place you know and and with Tomar 2 becoming a new Green Lantern ultimately he was basically dissuaded by his father's death you know for him it was crushing because it was like okay where's the justice here like where where's where's the response to my father being killed you know and that's one of the things that kind of drives his character that's what he's been doing so far is that in his mind the man who killed his father is still alive his father's dead but this man's still alive apparently he was worthy of a second chance well worthy according to who like who decided with an absolute certainty this guy deserves a second chance and whoever whoever said that was wrong and so in turn tomar 2 killed that guy of course after having taken over the mantle of the dark stars and and that's what kind of leads us to the current moment now the big thing about this is that john stewart's initial response is we have to defeat the star the dark stars without killing them we have to show the world or show the universe that justice can be served 
without murdering people and you know whether it's justified or unjustified but here's the funny thing when it comes to head-to-head -head confrontations like this wars in this capacity are won by those who are willing to do what the others won't two armies who are even in power fighting against each other it'll come down to which one's ever you know whichever one's willing to do what the other one's not you know whoever is willing to push the limits go to the ends of the earth and and basically do what needs to be done and so in a lot of ways john stewart is handicapping his own team he's handicapping the green lanterns by saying look you can't kill the dark stars we have to change their hearts and minds and while that's admirable at the end of the day it really seems kind of pointless because how can you change the mind of a person who's held in on revenge the one thing they want is the one thing you're denying them and so it's it's, it's interesting you know in this situation and so while all this conversation is going on it's kind of a funny little tidbit here while all this conversation is going on hector hammond is trying to make everybody happy and he's doing it by like modifying how they see everything and first they're at like a birthday party and then they're like at a at a game at like a baseball game who the hell goes to baseball games anymore and then they're uh then they're all on the beach which is kind of funny and, and it's just like like he's just making them jump through all these different things finally they tell him to call it off but it's kind of funny like i like i like hector hammond now like i want to see more of that kind of hector hammond for those of you guys who are new to comics this is the kind of thing that changes people like like people will go through and they'll read characters i've, I've seen it for years and years and years and years people will go through and they'll read characters and won't really care about them and then like a thing will happen and fans will be like you know what i like that guy now and like they'll, they'll like that person you know they'll be like i love carol danvers now or i hate carol danvers now or something like that they'll, they'll be on this position where like they're, they're like their view of that character will change because of like one thing because of, of one instance of how it's written and so it's it's, it's kind of cool and it's kind of funny but nonetheless with the green lanterns facing off against the dark stars this is really more of a repeat of the early stages of the sinestro core war for those of you guys who remember that when the green lanterns were not authorized to kill they were basically running and dodging all the time they were constantly in a state of retreat because the sinestro core were not limited by the bounds of killing they killed green lanterns everywhere they found them and so anytime a green lantern ran into a member of the sinestro core or multiple members they would basically take pot shots and they would they would they would they'd hightail it out of there and if the sinestro core was chasing after them they would just play retreat or they would play defense until they got to a larger number of green lanterns fend off as best they could and get out of there it wasn't until the green lanterns were allowed to kill that the battle became more even and so it's, it's a really interesting situation because when you have these dark stars what makes them so difficult what makes them so deadly here is the fact that they can teleport they teleport around also keep in mind that while they all do have their own individual perceptions that their tactical capabilities are all linked telepathically by the controllers which in turn are used by uh by tomar too and so what this means is that he's kind of like a one-man army right like he's kind of directing all these members who are all basically automatons and in turn like they're launching all these different strike attacks at the uh, at the green lanterns they're all you know using this this massive coordinated attack and then teleporting in and out and it makes them almost impossible to catch and so this is a whole new kettle of beans because for the most part it is you know you got like orion on this little scooter thing you know his little scooter thing uh and then of course you've got like general zod here and there's a lot of restraint that's being orchestrated because it's basically a battle on two fronts you've got you know a massive number of the dark stars who are facing off against like Hal jordan and orion and Kyle rayner and guy gardner and those guys and then you've got the dark stars who are back at mogo attacking the headquarters and so it's it's, it's cool to see this unfold because you're talking about people coming together who would normally never fight together and seeing general zod fight alongside the the lantern like fight alongside Arkillo of the sinestro corps and the other green lanterns and then of course like like orion is actually pretty cool because you would never really see anything like this now of course with regards to to general zod himself and even with the guardians of the universe stepping in by and large their power is not really enough to stop the dark stars because the dark stars were able to overpower the controllers who of course are formidable in and of themselves but again having a hive mind being able to strategically plan out entire events and knowing where every other member of the dark stars are in striking in a coordinated fashion makes things incredibly difficult because you got to remember this is basically a battle on the spot for for the green lanterns it's just kind of the dark stars are suddenly here and so it's not like they had a huge amount of time to plan out how they're going to you know to strategically attack and even if they did there's no guarantee it would have gone to form because they're not all linked to the same mind and so that's one of the things that orion points out here we're way out of our league like we we can't fight an enemy like this head on because we're getting absolutely decimated by these guys they're just too tactical too strategic there's nothing we can do here and so hal jordan is kind of like the trojan horse right like hal jordan grabs hector uh, hector hammond and they take off to the controllers where their minds are linked and the idea of hector hammond is to sever the telepathic link and it's kind of funny because venditti plays on this idea that it's going to be like an almost insurmountable uh, surmountable task and it's going to be wildly difficult to achieve and so when he tells hector hammond here's what i need you to do hector hammond is like okay done and, and then that's it <laughs> So it's like, okay, so, so we've achieved this. Uh, okay, wh what's 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 the next thing that we do now? And it kind of catches Hal Jordan by surprise. He's kind of like, well, I mean, I didn't really expect it to be that easy, but that's cool. So <laughs> so this basically sends kind of a psychic shock through the minds of all the Dark Stars. And even if it only grants a brief moment of reprieve, that's all the Green Lanterns need to swoop in and try to take out the entire Dark Star group in one fell swoop. Now, of course, it doesn't quite work as 
this plan because even when you're talking about the dark stars losing their telepathic powers they're still very 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 dangerous in their own right at this moment right now they're more akin to the old you know old dark stars from like the 1990s the the original iteration of the group but for this purpose they're still pretty capable now the other half of this is that they are still teleporting around in rapid fashion and that's one of the other things what john stewart had done is he had kind of orchestrated this two-pronged attack the first was to cut off their telepathic connection using hal jordan and the second one was to use the tele a teleportation disruptor he built to block off their ability to teleport around and so that's what ends up happening here tomar 2 kind of starts talking trash jumps in front of hal jordan and he can't teleport away hal jordan gets the better of him gets the attack and that's when they start to panic and that's when they have to get out of there at the same time john stewart shows up with a full contingent of the green lanterns and says okay now it's time for us to start taking the fight to the dark stars this is classic green lantern storytelling it's one of the coolest things that, that you, you know that, that you get to see one of the things about the green lanterns and, and what makes them interesting in a lot of ways that marvel lacks is there's no like disheveledness you go and look at the cosmic landscape in marvel comics you walk into a comic book story you say okay i want to read cosmic marvel it's like we'll take your pick you've got guardians of the galaxy you've got nova you've got quasar you've got any number of the other things who are out there like you've got all these these huge expansive things you got the thanos book you got silver surfer you got all this stuff with dc it's not nearly that complicated with dc you don't have to worry about the eternals you know neil gaiman's eternals or anything like that it's just green lanterns done super simple and doing that basically allows a writer to consolidate and to focus strictly on the green lanterns with whatever it is they happen to be fighting against and whoever it is that they want to invoke keep things simple and action-packed at the same time and it works incredibly well and so having these guys face off against each other like this ultimately what it ends up doing is it comes down to hal jordan himself because in reality again the plan of john stewart's kind of failed and that's one of the failings of john stewart is is this belief that well we have to make sure that we stay the course we have to make sure we do the right thing and while that's admirable admiration does not win wars what wins wars is doing what needs to be done and john stewart at the end of the day is not doing what needs to be done if they truly want to win they have to kill all the dark stars to cut them off entirely in response to this hal jordan kind of picks up the slack and says well then fine because i'm basically walking talking willpower i'll channel that directly into the dark stars themselves and so where he faces off directly against tomar 2 he's able to hold his own i mean tomar 2 is is by no means a slouch but the funny thing about this is that in this fight between the two tomar 2 really keeps asking the question how can you be okay with the fact that your dad died like that you know because it was essentially negligence it was a it was an aircraft that wasn't ready to fly it took off it blew up the most predictable scenario happened and your pop side in the process how can you be okay with this and how jordan's response was well because it's made me who i am if everything that's ever happened to me in my life and everything i've ever said and ever done and has ever been done to me and has ever been said to me has led me to this place right now it couldn't have been that bad because this made me the hero that i am but for tomar too he's driven by grief he's driven by grief and driven by rage and revenge and all these different things that sort of come together to coalesce and turn him into a dark star and so in response to this you know hal jordan is for the most part able to defeat him he's able to take him out because again at the end of the day tomar too is no he's no hal jordan and so when this is going on suddenly you have general zod who steps up and this is why i like zod so much because zod's like okay so there's basically those who seek victory and those who are too weak to find it and so in this instance he says like i'm just gonna i'm gonna start, start killing people like that's what this is now these guys are gonna keep on fighting and fighting and fighting until they win they'll fight to the last man and so if that if what they want to do is fight to the last man then i'll just help them along the way and so in the process he goes to kill one of the dark stars john stewart guy gardner kyle rayner step in and say do not kill him we have to find a better way but hal jordan again steps in saves the day hal jordan basically ends up taking like all the willpower that makes him who he is and channeling it directly into the dark stars energy source and then by doing that basically imbues like like imbues all of them with willpower now the reason why he does this is because previously guy gardner had told him look i used willpower in order to overcome my dark star suit and hal jordan is nothing if not strategically intelligent he's not the sharpest tool in the shed you're never going to see hal jordan go to mit he's just too dumb but with regards to like military combat training and with regards to like experience and being out there the guy's got it where it counts and so putting two and two together he literally channels willpower through their energy source and then basically overrides the dark star technology and so with the dark star technology being overridden it's like removing a red lantern ring the person returns to their normal self and tomar too is literally just driven by like grief at this point he's just kind of like i can't believe i did all this that i that i went on a rampage like this and did all these different things and in a moment when general zod goes to try to kill him what what tomar too ends up doing is actually killing himself he ends his own life and so he's just kind of like i'm beyond redemption there's nothing i can do to make up for this and so he took the only step he felt he could by basically ending his own life and so in this moment what ends up happening is of course his ring races off to go find a replacement the war is basically done the dark stars are gone the sources ended you know there, there really doesn't seem to be any indication they'll make their return and of course this leads basically into the epilogue and it's a cool thing because remember ever since edge of oblivion the green lantern number has been reduced to almost zero when you had this massive green lantern core that was basically thrust all the way to the very beginnings of the universe and had to work their 
their way back to the modern day, uh, so many of them were lost in the process. Now, in reality, it was a way for DC to thin the herd. It was a way for D. It was it was like DC's version of decimation for the X Men. Get rid of the lanterns that just didn't really have a plot point or they really couldn't do anything with, and then keep the ones that everybody loved, along with a few others just to bolster the ranks, and then send the group back out into the main DC universe at the beginning of Rebirth. And so, with this whole thing happening, what they need are more Green Lanterns. And so that's why John Stewart basically ends up, uh, you know, kind of beginning the ceremony, which basically sees the creation of a whole new host of rings being sent out directly into the universe itself and seeking out a whole new host of Green Lanterns. And so it's basically everything returning back to the status quo. It's almost like Robert Venditti's way of saying, okay, let's transition everything back to right before Jeff John started Green Lantern, where we have this vast number of lanterns and we can basically kind of go through and start crafting whole new stories. And so at the tail end of this, we get to see the return of a familiar character. We get to see Hal Jordan returning to Earth, traveling to Coast City, and meeting Carol Ferris. And this is actually pretty exciting. This is a big deal. We haven't seen her for a very long time. And so it's, it's, it's cool because there's a lot of questions that come out of this. Will she return to being a star sapphire? Is she just going to be the love interest of Hal Jordan? Are they going to have a life together, pop out a couple kids? Like we, we really don't know what direction things are going to go in with regards to the two of them in, in this comic book line. But I'm very, very excited to find out. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like and I will catch you all later. Peace.